Chapter 76, Hidden Moon Part 4, Eclipsed Soul While waiting for a response from the leaf, Shino isn't slacking off. Despite Tsukino's willingness to reveal such secrets of her village being a sure sign they will join the Union, Shino still has work to do. The resources the Union nations could provide would greatly aid, especially if they need to import anything like they do for the Gashinboku's treatment. Major advancements have been made since the LEAF's medical team began working with the RAIN's engineering teams. The pod that kept Conan alive for nearly a year has been improved upon to great results, and if someone finds themselves in a similar situation as Conan, they'd be healed much quicker. That's but one example of how much the shinobi villages can accomplish by working together. He's gotten more involved in learning about the Hidden Moon Village and has actually been doing his job well of representing the Hidden Leaf and the Shinobi Union, in addition to the surprise task he was given of determining the true nature of the sacred tree, Gashinboku. In particular he's tried to get more involved with the team that cares for the tree, mostly driven by his suspicions surrounding this Hakui character. During his stay, he's tried to remember, but Hakui keeps actively avoiding him, citing shyness and introvertedness, but that's definitely not it. Hakui is up to something, he knows it. He just has to prove it. Currently he's in the lab with Higure Kuchinashi to make more of the curative substance they use to treat their sacred tree. Conveniently, Hakui has fallen ill so he's taken sick leave. Shino's suspicions only increase. The Aburama clan are actually one of the clans that have been tasked to tend to some of the flora and fauna of the hidden leaf, since their jutsu requires them to learn much on the subjects, so he does show great interest in the process. The Aburama and the Senju jointly do something not too dissimilar to what Higure's team does. As previously stated, it requires specific ingredients found all over the world, which can't be cheap to get. Certain grasses, flower buds that need to be crushed into fine paste, even water from very specific locations. Shino raises the vial of the finished light green liquid. Nicely done. Higure compliments him. Thank you. Shino nods. But it's still different. I can't probe Hakui for information, so maybe I can get Higure to doubt, as well. He thinks over his options and how to best proceed. However, I believe it's still incomplete. The ones I saw Hakui use had a darker coloration, so I believe I'm still missing something. Hmm? Higure cocks his head and takes a closer at the vial. No, this is the correct color. Are you certain? I could swear it's a lighter color than what he used. Perhaps I miscalculated the proportions. Higure shakes his head. You must have seen wrong. Come. He beckons Shino to follow. The head researcher leads Shino to one cabinet in particular and takes out a storage scroll. After laying it out on the counter, Higure performs the necessary hand signs and several dozen vials of green liquid appear on top of the scroll, as well as a few empty ones placed back for storage. The liquid is the same green as what Shino had just made. See? It's the same as what you just made. Honestly I wish everyone picked up as easily as you did. Higure adds with a jovial laugh. Would definitely make my job easier. He doesn't seem to keep whatever he uses here. That much would be obvious, the chance of being caught is too high. Shino muses to himself. There has to be something else that doesn't match up. As his eyes dart around, he spots another possible source of doubt right in front of him. So these are the latest batch, yes? 24 vials left and 6 already used this month. Yes, that's. Higure stops for a moment and furrows his brow. 24? There should be 25 of them left. Only 5 days have passed this month. He takes a moment to carefully count them all out. That's our uh, did Hakui misplace one? That's unlike him. If he did, would he have reason not to report it? Surely he's aware how valuable they are. I'm sure it was an honest mistake, he's not usually a careless one. Now the risk is trying not to seem too invested in this particular matter, to not draw suspicion to himself instead. The Gashinboku has been a valuable asset to the Hidden Moon Village and could be a valuable asset to not just the Shinobi Union, but the world at large. I fear such mistakes could cause great harm. Higure stiffens at the mention of the Union not taking this kind of lacking discipline well. Even if he might not take my suspicions seriously, if he thinks the Moon's status with the Union could be put at risk. Higure Kuchinashi himself might not be too concerned, but he knows Tsukino values these negotiations greatly. That's you're absolutely correct. Higure quickly changes his attitude. These are important matters. I'll make sure to fix this post haste. Don't let it be known that Higure Kuchinashi doesn't value an impeccable work ethic. I'll visit Hakui right away to ensure we're not missing a batch. Very well. Shino nods. I do apologize for such a threatening tone. You're a good man, but I fear that's being taken advantage of. 
Higgier puts everything back in storage, including the vial that Shino made, and the two head out, the door locking behind them. I also apologize for this. Two tiny kakechu fly out from under Shino's robes and silently climb into Higgier's back pocket. While Shino goes on to do other tasks around the villages, Higgier goes directly for Hakui's home to clear up what happened to one of the vials. The door is opened by a rather sickly looking Hakui, wrapped in a fluffy and comfy blankie, and putting on a face mask just as he opens the door. He's hunched over and looks up with a strained expression to his guest. Higgier. Hakui coughs as he speaks up. It takes him a few seconds to get his breath back. Can I help you with something? I'm really sorry to disturb you while you're sick, I just have one quick question concerning the cure for Gashinboku. Have you perchance misplaced a vial? Hakui remains still for a moment, thankful for his mask hiding his features. What do you mean? Well, Shino and I were in the lab, and he noticed the vials were off by one, there should have been one more vial, but we seem to be missing it. That's behind the ajar door, Hakui's hand scrapes at the door as he digs his fingers into it. Damn that Abu Rama. If he wasn't around, I would have been there to hide it all. He lowers his head in an act of remorse. That's, the truth is, I accidentally dropped it. I felt dizzy, I didn't know how ill, I was and adjust. His composure regained, he springs his head back up. I promise I was going to reimburse the cost myself, I have money saved, I'll replace it as soon as I can. Higgier waves his hands in dismissal. Now, now, you don't need to worry about it that much. Don't make your condition worse by worrying. I just wanted to know, is all. He smiles. You take care of your health, okay? Yes sir. Hakui bows. Thank you sir. As soon as Higgier turns around to leave, Hakui slowly closes the door. When he does, he rips the mask off his face, throws the blankie on the ground and runs toward his living room. The tiredness he exhibited before is nowhere to be seen. Hakui frantically searches his living room for something specific, finally finding it after a couple minutes of hurried searching. A radio. Shinga. Shinga, can you hear me? He calls through the radio. Damn it, you better not be out of range. Shinga. No answer. Shit. In his frustration, Hakui throws the radio on the sofa hard enough for it to bounce onto the floor. If the Abu Rama has actually figured it out. You better hurry, Shinga. We might not have as much time as you thought. Unbeknownst to Hakui, two small creatures take advantage of the confusion and are currently set to perform the task it was given. One Kakechu crawls up on the wall and finds a little hidey hole, from which it can wait for the opportune time to move about, while another one takes a more proactive approach. Team 5. Has been going around on their adventures these past couple days. They've kept going on missions with Tambo and Hifumi Sujibashi. They even had some instances of joining forces with other teams to carry out similar missions to the sea ranks they did back home, namely herding or culling wildlife. That's in addition to what they'd categorize as deer rank missions, like helping with collecting lumber, stabilizing dangerous terrain, and helping build better roads. It's not just things the land needs, but something that the Shinobi Union will need to facilitate travel being the allies. One mission in particular even has them return to Kofu Town's mine, personally requested by the foreman after their exceptional work a few days ago. There, they meet a familiar duo already present and waiting. Shinga, Dashin. Tambo approaches them. Seems like we're tied to this place, huh? He gives a jolly laugh. Shinga chuckles. It would seem so. You also have a mission here? We ask for both of you. The foreman Kakeru approaches. The boys just couldn't stop talking about what an awesome job you all did. He laughs. Then let's get to it. Dashin skips toward the other Genin. Dashin, Shinga calls to him, do play nice. He warns in an odd tone that goes undetected by Tambo. Yes sir. Dashin grins. Hifumi waves as he approaches. Hi again. Hi. Dashin waves back with similar enthusiasm. I'm really glad we can work together again. She grins. Kashiwama runs over to greet him, as well. You're ready to show off again, too. Always. Dashin chuckles. The three of them head toward the mines to perform their set tasks, with Genzai and Jiriki not far back. Genzai walks in his usual carefree swagger, but Jiriki looks more focused than normal. It's usually difficult to tell since he's always scowling, but Genzai's learned the nuances of his scrunched nose. Okay, what's the matter? I don't like him. Jiriki answers. Come on, man, you must have warmed up to Kashiwama by now. Genzai jests. Not him. Dashin. There's something? Off. It's like he's analyzing us. Didn't you notice it last time? Genzai shrugs. Maybe you're just paranoid. With good reason. Jiriki states. Some of the times. 
Genzai pats him on the back and picks up speed. The others, you just gotta trust people, you know? We're here as one of the great five ninja villages, people are gonna stare and have expectations. Juriki shakes his head. They do much lighter work than the previous job of clearing gas and making new tunnels, but it's still hard work and appreciated help. They're happy to find the miners have struck metaphorical gold and literal quartz. With Yuriki's help, they opened up the mine to the richest veins and have gotten a good deal mined already. Today's mission is to help get it all out, and Shinga and Dashin have the additional mission of transporting it back to Kofu town proper. The entire time Juriki keeps an eye on Dashin, thinking him odd. He's cheerful and excited, just like Kashiwama, Katori, and even Hifumi, but those three have an earnest aura around them. They're genuinely happy when they interact in their overly energetic way. Dashin doesn't appear genuine. There's something about his smile. During one instance, Dashin catches a glimpse of Juriki's staring who doesn't actually try to hide it as most people would. Dashin looks back with his odd smile. Is something on my face? Juriki narrows his eyes. Actually confronting him right now would be stupid, but maybe he can be provoked. He dusts his hands from the dust that had gathered. I was just wondering how strong you actually are. Your earth style matches Kashiwama's and he's pretty good. Oh? Dashin's smile somehow twists even further as he steps closer toward Juriki. How much do you want to find out? The two stand centimeters away from each other, Dashin looking down on the slightly shorter Juriki. They remain silent and motionless for a good few moments until Dashin's fingers twitch to move toward something. Juriki immediately moves his hand to stop him from doing whatever he was planning to. However, they're both stopped by a sharp voice. Dashin, Shinga calls out just as he enters the room. We're done here. Let's go. He says in a low growl, letting the boy know that was a direct order. Dashin's grin goes back down to a smile. Yes, sir. He walks away from Juriki, patting the young Yuga on the shoulder. Maybe next time. Yeah. Juriki just looks to him from the corner of his eye. Outside of the mine, away from prying eyes, Shinga's face continues to be scowled. What did I tell you about interacting with the leaf shinobi? Dashin chortles. I'd barely call them shinobi. Come on, just let me have a go at. He abruptly stops in his tracks. A heavy presence weighs Dashin down. His entire body freezes, he tries to utter a word, even a single sound, but his voice completely abandons him. He falls to his knees, unable to stand upright. He clutches at his chest in a desperate attempt to regain his breath, to no avail. It would seem you continue to misunderstand my words. Do you perhaps think I say these things lightly? Do you think I say them in jest? Shinga eases his killing intent, allowing Dashin to finally gasp for air. Pick yourself up. Shinga continues to walk forward. Dashin wipes away the beads of sweat from his brow and tries to stand on his wobbling legs. He glares at Shinga but follows after. The two of them finish their mission as they're meant to. They help the miners load up the quartz and they transport it back to town. A simple, easy, and fairly boring finish to their job. When the time comes for them to head back while Team 5 remains to go on other missions. So, did you get one? Dashin asks with a slight sense of apprehension. Yes, Shinga answers. A cluster of high-quality quartz, the final ingredient I need. Just be sure to follow orders this time. The final stage is the most important one. Dashin lowers his head. Yes, sir. Kakechu are extraordinary little creatures. They're some of the most versatile beings on the planet with their ability to adapt to any and all situations. It's what's made the Aburama clan such a force and feared even before the hidden villages were established. Currently, two in particular have burrowed their way into Hakui's home's walls and are in search for any evidence of wrongdoing. Of course, they could go out in the open, but that runs the risk of them being spotted, so they were given instructions to remain hidden. They have one very specific task to search for a compound of similar composition to the one their master had previously made. They slowly make their way through the walls and halt their pace if there's too much movement. They're aware that they could potentially be detected by a shinobi with particularly acute senses. It's moments such as these that they wish they could directly communicate with their master. During one such moment where they remain still, the person whose house they're invading is speaking to two other humans. Where have you been? Hakui demands. I've been trying to reach you all day. Today seems to be a very peculiar day. Both you and Dashin are forgetting your place. Shinga walks right up to Hakui, looking down on his subordinate. Would you like to repeat yourself, this time choosing your tone more carefully? Hakui looks down and grits. I'm. I'm sorry. Shino Aburama, I think he's definitely onto me. 
From what I gather from Higir Kuchinashi, he's been looking into the concoction a lot more lately, and if he figures out what my true goal has been. And that is the result of your failure to properly cover your tracks. Shinga walks in and takes a seat on the couch. Dashin follows behind and stands behind one of the armchairs. I tried. I just didn't have enough time. Hakui defends himself. Shinga sighs and covers his face in his palm. No, that's on me. Subtlety was never your strong point, that's why you got caught the first time, after all. He gives Hakui a sharp glance from between his fingers. I'm aware of that. So what are we going to do now? Dashin looks back to the wall behind him. He tilts his head in curiosity, feeling like he's hearing something he shouldn't be. Nothing? Shinga answers simply. I've acquired the high-quality quartz I need. I can perform the ritual, and it'll be too late for the leaf to stop us. You, he makes it a point to motion to Hakui with his index, just need to keep laying low, and pray the Aburama doesn't figure it out. Dashin runs his hands over the wall and keeps a close ear. I'll try, but you know it's out of my hands at this point. Hakui gives an exasperated sigh before turning to Dashin. And just what are you doing? I think I hear something. Dashin answers. Just as he says that, they hear a loud crash coming from behind the wall. A pained curse follows shortly after and the distinct sound of arguing. Hakui shakes his head. My neighbors are redecorating. It's been somewhat loud as of late. Hmm. Dashin breaks away from the wall and goes back to the armchair. Within the wall, just where Dashin had been up until now, the Kakechu continue moving now that they've avoided being sensed. How long do you think it'll take? Hakui asks. Two days. Do you think you can manage? Shinga asks. Hakui nods. I can. Shinga grins. Good answer. At least one of you is learning. Let's go, Dashin, we have our own preparations to do. Shinga stands up and, followed by Dashin, heads out into the village. Hakui sighs with relief as he closes the door, pleased that soon these little games will come to an end. The Kakechu scour the entire apartment from the inside out, although they use some opportunities to come outside, as well. There's some instances where Hakui leaves his apartment which allows for much easier movement on their part. They fly to every single drawer, shelf, cupboard, and cabinet in the place, and search for the liquid Shino told them to search for. They move while trying to leave zero evidence of their presence, which means prying open some boxes, rather than eating through them, as would normally be their strategy. They fly around and inspect until they finally reach one cupboard in particular. Hidden deep inside is a vial of green liquid, exactly what they're looking for. It's sealed so when they climb onto it, they have to open the lid as best as they can to get a closer look. It takes a few solid tries to spin the cap open with their tiny legs and even their mandibles, but they finally manage it. One of them climbs inside while the other waits at the top. The first Kakechu sticks to the wall of the vial while going further down. When it reaches the liquid, it starts probing with its mandibles. Normally, the Kakechu are able to take in foreign elements and analyze them with the help of their host. Through generations, they've developed many resistances thanks to their predecessors which would normally protect them. Whatever this is, however, proves too strong for this Kakechu. It convulses and falls right into the mysterious liquid, unmoving. The second Kakechu rushes inside in a panic and tries to grab its companion and lead them both outside. With quite a bit of struggling, it takes much more time than normal, and the other Kakechu ends up becoming soaked in the liquid, as well. It didn't drink any of it so it doesn't immediately fall like its friend did, but this does make things considerably more difficult. It grabs the first Kakechu with all of its six legs and flies up with great effort. It's precisely during this that the front door opens and Hakui comes inside. The Kakechu is well aware time is not on their side and it needs to act faster than ever. Fortunately, Hakui spends some time mulling around in his apartment so it hopefully has time to hide. It manages to fly up to the edge of the vial and is very close to exiting. It's then that Hakui opens the cupboard the vial is in. He's yet to see the intruders since they're hidden deep, but it's now or never. Hakui pushes aside the items that keep the vial hidden, while the Kakechu pulls its fallen comrade out. With only a second to spare, the Kakechu jumps to the ground and hides in the corner, just as Hakui reaches back and grabs the vial. The Kakechu grabs onto a cloth while still clinging onto its companion, in hopes that it won't be spotted, even if the human moves things around. Thankfully, Hakui doesn't. He does, however, take a moment to glance at the vial, trying to remember if he'd left it open before. With all the emotion of Shinga becoming more aggressive and the fear that he'll be discovered, Hakui doesn't spend too much time on it and just accepts that he might have forgotten to fully close it while rushing. He's had way too much on his mind lately. 
he places the vial in a bag and goes back outside. The Kakechu uses this opportunity to slowly but surely fly away. It goes to the other side of the room where a window is slightly ajar to let air in. It flies outside carrying the other Kakechu, but doesn't manage to reach far. By the time it gets to the roof of the neighboring building, the strange liquid takes effect. It begins to bob up and down in its flight until it no longer has the strength to go. It tries to push forward to keep going and finish their mission, but the more effort it exerts, the harder it gets. It collapses, having done as much as it could. The two Kakechu lie motionless on the rooftop. Shinga makes his way to the main administrative tower of the Hidden Moon Village. He walks with focus, knowing exactly what he must do and who he needs. His first stop is Lady Tsukino's office, or more specifically, the secretary's desk in front of the office. He knows that Tsukino and Shino Aburama are currently away, so he has some freedom to do as he pleases. Ah, Shinga, how may I help you? Yuzara perks up as she sees someone approach. I'm afraid Lady Tsukino is away currently. Yes, I'm well aware. He holds up his hand in front of him in a one-handed sign. It's you I need. Markings appear on Shinga's brow, spreading from his forehead to above his brow, in a flowing flame-like pattern. The very center of it bears a resemblance to a third eye. Jibaku. Yuzara freezes in place as markings more simplified than Shinga's appear on her own forehead. Let's go. Shinga issues the order. Yuzara stands up without a word and obediently follows Shinga. He leads her to a very particular and unassuming part of the tower that she seems to know more about than some would assume. She undoes a series of barrier and seals that ultimately lead to a hidden room through an illusory wall. Inside in an overly simplistic square room covered in seals and tags that contains only one very important element. A large green oval, its texture appearing somewhat wooden, with multiple branch-like protrusion clinging onto the walls. Its oddity is only increasing by the very light green glow emanating from within this item. Shinga places a scroll on the ground and releases the large chunk of quartz he'd stored inside. He looks over some jutsu formulae that very clearly has a different origin than the rest, ones that he himself had placed here much earlier. Return your post. Shinga orders and Yuzara has no choice but to do as she's told. He places the quartz in a specific spot in front of the giant seed and prepares another series of jutsu formulae that spread from underneath it and join with the other markings that surround the seed. Just a little more. A little more life for you to absorb before you can be free. Higher up in the tower, Yuzara returns to her place at the desk, and the jutsu releases itself, leaving the woman none the wiser of what she'd just done. There's a moment of confusion that washes over her, and a sense that something's changed since she last blinked, but she quickly dismisses it. When Team 5 return from their missions for the day, they enter their apartment with some excitement, or at least the usual level of excitement for them. Kashiwama is as hyper as ever, Genzai tends to share in his positivity, although to a lesser extent, and Juriki treats it all like a chore. When they enter the living room, fully prepared to share how their day had gone, they're met with a somewhat more somber Shino-sensei. To some people, the difference would be unnauticable, but part of their training has been to gauge what mood Shino is in. It's a tough task, but Juriki and Genzai actually manage to do a good job of reading their sensei. Shino-sensei? Genzai is the first to speak up is something the matter? Shino takes a moment to take a deep breath before he answers. I believe it will be. Genzai cocks his head. In what way? Juriki crosses his arms. Does that mean something will actually happen in this boring place? Kashiwama elbows him in the side. Come on, man. Truthfully, I don't yet know. I have suspicions that something may be afoot, but I've yet to collect any evidence of such. Shino answers truthfully. So. You just have a hunch? It's just a hunch, yes. I'm trying to prove one way or another, but it's taking time. I don't know when I'll have an answer, and initially I didn't want to cause you any needless worry, but. Come on, sensei, you should know us better than that. Kashiwama chimes in. We're team five, after all, all of us. We gotta work together in situations like this. Have you warned Lady Tsukino in the hidden moon? Genzai asks. Shino shakes his head. As I said, I lack anything other than a hunch. My word alone would not be taken seriously and if my hunch is correct, it would only alert him. I wanted to warn you, because. If something does end up happening, I'll be relying on your assistance. I don't know what would even happen, but I ask you be prepared to act. The three give an affirmative nod. Yes sir. We won't let you down. Kashiwama declares. Juriki, there may be something you could assist with, however. Shino says. If I can, I will. Tomorrow. For now, rest. You've worked hard and have earned it. 
The very next day, Shino takes Team 5 on a self-assigned reconnaissance mission. Since it's a day off, as well, they do actually take the time to enjoy their break, but the first order of business is, well, business. The street's nearby Hakui's apartment happens to conveniently be a busy street with shops and stores, so they have the excuse of why they'd be there if spotted. That takes care of one aspect of the job. Team 5 walk along, taking the time to stop by and buy snacks and even souvenirs to appear unassuming until they reach a spot that's close enough for their purposes. Can you see from here? Shino asks. Juriki nods. It's within my range, yes. He takes out a moon-shaped mask and places it on his face to hide his eyes. Genzai and Kashiwama take positions to hide him better while they munch on some sweet yaki. With everything set in place, Juriki focuses his chakra to his eyes. By Akugen, Juriki scans the building behind them, where Shino found out Hakui's apartment is, and scans as much as he can. His vision quickly darts through the different rooms as he zooms in and out of specific parts to inspect closer. He does take the occasional break as to not arouse suspicion from anyone walking nearby. Team 5 engage in small talk, and Juriki joins in when he can. After several minutes of doing this, Juriki finally takes off the mask and shakes his head. Nothing, I see. Shino sighs. Thank you for trying. What of my kakechu? Were they still inside? I did try to look for them, but they weren't inside, either. But, Juriki points directly above. I think I spotted them on the roof above us. Above us, Shino raises a brow. He looks around to ensure he's not being observed and flickers to the roof above. He walks around in search of his kakechu as Juriki pointed out, and he finds them after a minute of searching. He finds the two kakechu he'd sent out dead. He kneels down and gently scoops them in his hand. What happened to you? He mutters to himself. He takes the gourd off his back and has some of his kakechu carry the two fallen inside. When that's done, he flickers back to the ground to join his students. I'm sorry I couldn't help. Juriki lowers his head. Shino places a comforting hand on the boy's shoulder. No, you helped tremendously. Thank you. As they prepare to leave, Shino does spot something from the corner of his eye. Or, someone. Hakui is standing at the end of the street, looking right at them. Shino thought something like this might happen. The man does live here, after all. Shall we continue? Shino says a bit louder than he actually needs to. Or are your bellies full by now? Never. Kashiwama declares and runs off immediately. I think I smelled something tasty over there. As they continue walking down the street, Hakui doesn't move much. He tries to make himself look smaller and sickly as his story dictates. Good morning. Shino lightly bows his head as they pass by each other. I heard you were ill. I hope it's nothing serious. Hakui looks up at him through his golden strands. Just a common cold is all. These are your students? Shino nods. They are. Higure said they make delicious food here so I thought to treat them. That's because. They've been working hard lately and deserve some rest and relaxation. I see. Well, don't let me hold you. Hakui coughs. I wish you a speedy recovery. Hakui watches him move on and join back with his students. All the while, his mind races. He couldn't have come here because of me, could he? Shit, shit, shit. Hurry up, Shinga. The next day, Shino's Kakechu are still working within his special gourd. The inside has been fitted to serve as a breeding ground for insects with special properties. It's how he was able to breed a new generation who specialize in eating through the divine tree, and will hopefully now be used to determine what exactly it is that his two scouts found that left them in that state. If it was somehow Hakui's doing, then they wouldn't have been left out like that, they'd have been disposed of. It's highly likely that they escaped before they were actually spotted, which means they were caught in something. Now he just needs to figure out what. However, he won't have to wait for long as events are already set in motion. When someone knocks at the door, he goes to open it and is met by Tsukino's secretary, Yuzara. Good morning, I hope I've not caught you at a bad time. No, of course not. How can I help you? We've received a reply from the Hidden Leaf Village, you may come to collect it. Our team would need to read it, of course, in your presence. She informs him. Yes, of course. I only need a moment. Shino goes back into the apartment for a minute to collect his things before heading out with Yuzara. They walk further into the central moon tower, to the aviary where the message was delivered. Inside, Shino is greeted by Tsukino and the team who manage the aviary as they present him with the unopened scroll. They cut it open in his presence and read through it. It's a standard reply to his original letter. A thank you for updating them on the situation, requisition elaboration on the state of the Gashinboku, reaffirming of the importance it will hold to the Shinobi Union, 
and informing him of how the hidden leaf would advise the union to make use of this new knowledge. All in all, it's a standard reply on the surface, giving advice on how to proceed with the talks with the hidden moon village. On the surface, at least. Tsukino looks over the scroll and sighs. The information is already out there, huh? I will ensure your trust is not misplaced. Shino reassures her. Thank you. She lowers her head slightly. I'm glad the hidden leaf sent someone like you to meet with us. With the contents of the scroll verified, she hands it over to its rightful recipient. Your words honor me. He bows his head and takes the scroll. Pardon the interruption, Yuzara peeks her head in to address Tsukino, but you have a meeting soon with Shinga. Ah, yes, of course. We shall meet later then. Tsukino smiles to Shino and heads out. He follows right after, not having any further business in the aviary. As he heads back to the apartment, his mind goes over the possible hidden message that the hidden moon overlooked. It pains him to do this, especially with the level of trust they've shown him, but it's the only way for now. He can apologize profusely once it's all over. Once he gets inside, he goes for his writing supplies. He lays out the scroll on a table, dips a brush in the inkwell, and traces over the letters with a fresh brush. When finished, he draws a single line on his palm and performs a series of hand signs. I hope I've remembered this correctly, sigh. He places his palm with the line of ink at the base of the scroll. Ninja art. Living ink. The writing on the scrolls begins to wiggle and shift its position. The words snake their way across the scroll as they form new words. A report on Hakui. Shino reads through it and finally discovers why the man was familiar. He was a former medic in the Hidden Leaf Village, discharged 10 years ago. He was caught using experimental medicines that put massive strain on his patients and resulted in several deaths. He was immediately discharged from the hospital and soon exiled from the village and forbidden from practicing again. His specialty was poison. Shino mutters. He hurriedly grabs the scroll and runs out. So that's what it was. The vial he used, the one that went missing. It was poison. That's why his vial was darker. He's the reason the Gushin Boku has been weak. He makes it to Tsukino's office in record time and makes his way for the door without so much as stopping to look at Yuzora's direction. When the secretary sees him in a rush, she tries to stop him. Ah, excuse me, Lady Tsukino is currently in a meeting. I heard and I do apologize, but this is important. Shino unceremoniously opens the door. Inside, he's met by a startled Tsukino and Hakui who were not expecting the sudden intrusion. Shino? Tsukino raises a brow. Hakui's eyes widen in shock and a hint of fear at the Aburama's presence. I'm sorry, my lady, I tried to. Yuzora begins to explain. It's all right. Tsukino reassures her. Can I help you, Shino? Shino's cloak flutters as the sound of buzzing fills the air. You need to get away from that man. He's not who he says he is. Step aside, Hakui. Tsukino stands up and slams her hands on the desk. I don't know what this is about, but there will be no hostility in my office. Explain yourself. Hakui scrunches his nose in anger and frustration. You should have stayed away, Shino Aburama. He immediately reaches into his pack and pulls out a ball that he slams into the ground, causing it to explode in a green mist. Yuzora screams out and skids back out of the room. Shino sends out his kakechu into the smokescreen to go after Hakui, but they quickly become disoriented and fall to the ground. Poison mist? Of course. Just as he thinks over his next course of action, a figure rushes out of the mist and attacks him. His first instinct was that Hakui's going on the offensive, but much to his surprise, it's Tsukino. She slashes her sword with great speed and precision, giving Shino only barely enough time to dodge. When he has a moment to gather himself, he sees that she's not entirely herself. Her forehead is covered in markings, and her eyes are glossed over and hollow. She's looking in Shino's direction, but it's like she's looking through him, not at him. Lady Tsukino? Yuzora stammers out in her confusion as Shino stands in front of her to protect her. From the green mist, Hakui emerges behind Tsukino, now donning an odd black mask with red markings, bearing a striking resemblance to the ones now covering Tsukino's face. What have you done to Tsukino? Shino growls. It's not her you should be worrying about. Hakui smirks. Before Shino can ask what he means, he catches a glint of light from the corner of his eye. He steps back just in time to dodge the kunai aimed right at his neck. Yuzara swings her kunai again, her face covered in the same markings as Tsukino. Yuzara, as well. Tsukino takes advantage of his momentary distraction and lunges at him once more. Hakui reaches for the radio strapped to his waist. Shinga, I'm fighting Shino Aburama. You better be ready. 
deep beneath the moon tower, Shinga sighs in exasperation. He once again speaks in such a demanding tone. The child is yet to learn his lesson. He goes through a series of countless hand signs, going for a good minute or two before something actually happens. When he nears the end of his weaving, the seed flows with more intensity than it has before. As he performs more hand signs, more and more cracks appear on the seed, which allow even brighter light to burst from within. The branch-like protrusions that cover the walls pulsate with an odd sense of life. Come forth, Jubako. The seed breaks. Roots and branches envelop Shinga as they fill in the small room to the point of bursting. When it can no longer contain the mass, the walls and ceiling break. The entire structure shakes as large branches burst outside and envelop the outer walls of the moon tower. Large pieces of rock and buildings fall to the ground as the people scream in fear and run for their lives when they realize what's happening. Those who are able to process what they're seeing are immediately reminded of the divine tree's root that tried to take them all those years ago. Inside the tower, Shino has to struggle to keep his balance as the room breaks apart, all on top of trying to keep Tsukino and Yuzara safe until he figures out a way to break them out of whatever Hakui has done to them. The tree roots plunge into the ground and pulse, as if sucking nutrients from the ground. Slowly, its coloration turns a vile red. The more it consumes, the larger it grows and covers a much wider area than just the tower. The shinobi on the outside spring into action to try and sever them, but are met with unlikely resistance. Either some of their allies turn against them, faces covered in strange markings, or humanoid shapes made of mud emerge from the ground and take on their appearance, mud to Pelgingers fighting the originals. The massive red tree reaches the very top of the tower, where it presses against a protective barrier that surrounds the Gashinboku. At the outskirts of the village, Team 5 and Hifumi had taken the day off to walk around and do some light training, mostly at Kashiwama's insistence. During their break, Hifumi's attention is drawn behind them where the sight causes her to freeze in fear and drop her water bottle. Hifumi? Kashiwama gives a concerned look as he turned to her. He and Genzai and Juriki then see the sight of a massive red tree covering the moon tower and spreading its roots and branches further into the village. Genzai slowly stands up from his spot. Is that what Shino-sensei warned us about? Hifumi whips her head to him. Wait, do you know what that is? Do you know what's happening? She demands. No. But Shino-sensei was worried about something we didn't know about. This, Juriki clenches his fist. It's happening again. Not on our watch. Kashiwama runs ahead. Boy, hold up. Genzai takes a step to follow him, but stop to grab Hifumi by the hand before he continues, now dragging her along. Juriki follows shortly after. What did your sensei say? What was he worried about? Hifumi continues asking, trying to wrap her mind around what she saw. We don't know. Genzai shakes his head. He just told us to be ready if something happens and something's happening. We can ask all the questions we want later. Juriki picks up the pace. Just as he gets further ahead to match Kashiwama's speed, he notices his teammate's pained expression. Before he can even express any concern, Kashiwama holds his head in pain and falls to his knees. Boy. Jerky stops to check up on him. What happened? Genzai and Hifumi stop by his side as well. I don't. No. He rubs his temple. I got a massive headache all of a sudden. Can you keep going? Juriki asks bluntly. Kashiwama takes a moment to breathe deeply before answering. Yeah. Before they can actually pull themselves together to keep running to the hidden moon and the mysterious red tree in it, they sense something coming their way. A ball of fire comes crashing down right in the middle of their little gathering. Kashiwama grabs Hifumi and pulls her to safety, while Genzai and Juriki each jump back to safety. From the settling dust, Dashin walks out with a black mask on his face, covered in red markings. What the hell are you doing? Kashiwama calls out. Dashin only laughs in response. Whatever I want. Juriki pulls on his bow and conjures an arrow from its storage. I told you this guy was giving me the creeps. And it's too late to do anything about it now. Dashin laughs. Shinga said to leave you guys alone, but. I just can't. Dashin slams his hand on the earth below him. Forbidden Jutsu? Mud golems. Four figures of mud emerge from the ground to surround Dashin. One each for Genza and Jiriki and two Kashiwama and Hifumi. Slowly, the mud beings take shape to form more defined facial feature and even clothes. Their eyes widen in shock when they each end up facing a copy of themselves. Let's play. Dashin cackles. End of chapter 76. Name meanings. Jubako equals tree child. Author notes. In the game Naruto Shippuden. 
Ultimate Ninja Heroes 3, the mind-controlling jutsu that Shinga uses is called Jibakigan, self-bondage I. I removed the part of it being a pseudo de jutsu because it really doesn't need to be. Chapter 77, Hidden Moon Part 5, Darkened Heart. Shino deftly dodges the barrage of attacks Tsukino and Yuzara are hurling at him, while Hakui just stands back and watches with a gleeful expression. With the tower now in ruins, their scenery has changed to the outside, where they have a close view of the reddened tree that's enveloped the moon tower. The entire time, Shino's been trying to lead the fight further away from the tree. He was never the strongest at Taijutsu, at least when compared to some of the monsters he's friends with, but he hasn't gotten to his position without becoming pretty good at it. He ducks between their sword and kunai slashes, while parrying with his own kunai when avoiding isn't an option. That mask he's wearing, he didn't put it on just for show. Shino analyzes the situation. The markings are similar to the ones on their foreheads, which means it must be somehow connected to whatever jutsu's effect they're under. Let's try something out. When Yuzara next slashes at him, he doesn't dodge or parry it. Instead he grabs her hand, at the expense of being stabbed with the weapon, also he can get her in place. He focuses his chakra in his right hand that's holding onto her closed fist, and performs a quick one-handed sign with his free hand. Release. He fully channels his chakra to cancel Genjutsu, but when he looks toward Yuzara with a glint of hope, she kicks him away. Hakui laughs. This Genjutsu is a little bit more difficult to break. Thank you for confirming that it is indeed a Genjutsu. Shino says as he gets up to his feet to block a sword strike by Tsukino. Hakui scowls. You little. Always arrogant, you Aburama. He reaches into his pouch to take out a small syringe-like device. With an aimed eye, he throws it right at Yuzara. Seeing this, Shino runs past Tsukino to intercept the syringe before it can hit its intended target. The downside is that this leaves him open long enough for Yuzara to slash him across the back. Hakui takes out a small ball similar to the one he threw at the start of this mess. Well, it's not like I care if she actually gets poisoned. It's an antidote Shino panics for a moment, realizing that Hakui fully intends to throw another poison mist bomb right at them. Shino turns around to forcefully administer the antidote before she gets poisoned. Of course, she's not about to allow her enemy to stab her with anything. Shino struggles with her and Tsukino for a moment before he himself throws the syringe. Yuzora dodges out of the way, but the syringe suddenly changes its trajectory mid-air. Several tiny kakechu carry the syringe right into Yuzora's side, just as Hakui throws another poison bomb. The entire street becomes covered in the gas. For a moment, there's silence in their immediate area. The sound of clashing metal no longer rings through the air, just the distant cries and wails of the panicked masses, and Hakui has to wonder for a moment if it actually worked, if Shino was taken down. He walks through the green cloud to find a most tantalizing sight when he leaves it. Shino Aburama is kneeling on the ground with Tsukino's sword stabbed through his back, while Yuzara lies on the ground. Shino coughs and clutches his chest where the exit wound is. It wasn't an antidote. Hakui bursts into a fit of laughter. Of course not. Why would I care if some low-rank secretary lives or dies? She had one job and she performed it magnificently. He walks toward Shino with a hop to his step. When Shino moves in an attempt to free himself, Tsukino tugs on the sword, causing him to cry out in agony. Hakui stops a fair distance away from Shino, knowing full well that he's still not entirely in the clear. How does it feel, Shino Aburama? It feels rather pleasant, actually. Shino looks back to him with a smirk. Just then, Yuzara and Tsukino's form, and even Tsukino's sword, all dissolve in black essence. Buzzing fills the air as where the two Kanoichi previously stood are now clouds of darkness that flutter toward him. Kakechu clones. Shit. 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 Hakui reaches for his pouch again in a rush as the Kakechu swarm toward him, and slams another poison mist ball into the ground just in time. The Kakechu that don't manage to stop on time fall to the ground, while the rest return to Shino. How did you know the syringe didn't contain an antidote? Hakui demands. Where are Tsukino and Yuzara? How did you pull it off? It's simple. I had a hunch that you wouldn't want to cure her. In fact, it makes more sense to leave her vulnerable and force me to focus on saving her, rather than protecting myself. That's all. That's it? You guessed? You just guessed? Hakui repeats in disbelief. Well, that didn't do you any good. You still couldn't get me. He tries to turn this into a positive. I didn't need to. As for your second question. Shino points further back into the street, where the sight of Tsukino and Yuzara chasing down another Shino can be seen. I merely led them away with another Kakechu clone, while I was hidden by your poison cloud. 
Pakui's eyes widen in shock. No. I have to get them back here. You incompetence. Get back here. He shouts. I fear. It's already too late for you to win. The second Shino turns around to run toward the original, with Tsukino and Yuzara in hot pursuit. They still slash at him, but even as a clone, he dodges well. That is, until the final stretch. The clone leaves just enough of an opening for both of them to lunge at him and pierce him through the back. The second Shino bursts into a cloud of darkness as the Kakechu clone dissipates back into a swarm of Kakechu that covered Tsukino and Yuzara's entire bodies. No. Hakui internally panics. I need to get those insects off of them. He throws yet another bomb in their direction, aiming to kill these ones as he managed with the others, but this time it's not going to work. As I've said, it's too late. A swarm of Kakechu rises from the ground to intercept the bomb and lead it high up in the air where it detonates, only killing a handful of the parasitic insects. The ones covering Tsukino and Yuzara are still intact in spite of their attempts to rid themselves of the beetles that are crawling over them. Shino uses this chance to flicker right next to Tsukino, who tries to swing at him when she spots him, but the distraction proves effective. Shino reaches for the necklace that hangs on Tsukino's neck and crushes it in his hand. The shattering glass necklace releases a light purple cloud to fill the immediate area, covering both of them as well as Yuzara. When the purple mist is blown away, Tsukino and Yuzara lie on the ground, panting but very much free of the effects of Jibaku. With their faces returned to normal, they look around their surroundings and take in the sights and noises that now fill their beloved village. What? How? Hakui cries out. The sap of the Gashinboku carries with it many properties. One being, the cancelling of Genjutsu. Shino explains. There's no way the Gashinboku's sap still has the strength to do that. I made sure of it. It's true, you've weakened the sacred tree, but sap that was harvested from before is unaffected. Hakui now finds himself in a bind. He still has his poison mist to cover for him, but he's in a much more dangerous position than before. He no longer has pawns to rely on, and he knows he can't take Shino on in a fight. He needs to run. He needs to get to Shinga and hide in the comfort of the Jubako. Before he can even take one step, however, the poison cloud is blown away by a strong gust of wind. He turns his head to see Tsukino, still exhausted but with a fiery glint in her eyes, has slashed the cloud away. Before he can even react, two kunai plunge into his chest as Yuzara jumps over with even more kunai prepared. Why don't I show you what a low-rank secretary can do? Yuzara growls, her memory of the experience restored thanks to the potent powers of the sap. She throws two more kunai that Hakui just barely manages to dodge, but Tsukino takes advantage of his stumbling to avoid the kunai. She runs forward and stabs Hakui right through the chest. No tricks, no insect clones. Tsukino unceremoniously pulls out her blade from the shocked and gasping Hakui and kicks him to the ground. This wasn't supposed to happen. Hakui manages to whisper as his final breath before falling unconscious. Shino walks over to the two of them. Are you well? Tsukino cleans the blood off her sword. Thanks to you, yes. We could have ended up much worse if you'd taken us on with your full capabilities. Perhaps, or perhaps not. Either way, the solution I required was one that left you both still able to stand. Your village needs you. What? Is that thing? Yuzara looks up in the tree that's now lashing out further into the village. It seems as if this thing is growing by the minute and lashing out at the moon shinobi with even greater might. Is this another divine tree attack? Tsukino asks. Shino shakes his head. I don't believe it is. Whatever it is, it's different, and it's why Hakui has been poisoning the Gashinboku to ensure that it can't fight back as it did six years ago. How are we even meant to fight it? You need to focus on the Hidden Moon Village right now. Your people need you to protect them, and you shinobi need you to guide them. Leave this to me. Tsukino stomps her foot in protest. I can't just allow someone else to fight our battles for us. Shino looks back to her with a calm expression. This is what it means to be part of the larger shinobi world. We aid each other in any way we can, but most importantly, we allocate our resources as need be. In this situation, these are our roles that ensure our victory. Not just for the Hidden Moon but the Shinobi Union. I ask that you trust in me and provide aid when everyone is safe. Tsukino grits her teeth in frustration at how right he is. Fine. You better not die, Shino Aburama. We'll come back you up as soon as we can. Thank you. Let's go, Yuzara. Yes ma'am. The two of them flicker away to organize their forces. Shino looks up at the towering tree. Well then. Let's get to work. His cloak flutters as if blown by strong winds even though there are none. 
He calls forth his kakechu to cover certain parts of his body, getting the swarm to cover him enough to where they can lift him. With the aid of his insects, Shino flies upward. Wherever you three are, I hope you're safe. Kashiwama Senju and Hifumi Sujibashi vs. Kashiwama and Hifumi Kashiwama holds his head in pain as a copy of himself just emerges from the ground, with copies of his friends also appearing to face them. Of all the times to get sudden pains, this is possibly the worst. Are you okay? Hifumi places a hand on his shoulder while keeping her eyes glued to their two copies. These things, what are they? I don't know, but it can't be good. He stands up to his feet despite the mild vertigo he's experiencing. To the site, Genzai and Jiriki have already engaged their copies and are leading their battles away for now, or more accurately, are being forced to move away. Whatever Dashin wants, he doesn't want Team 5 together, and probably with good reason. What should we do? Hifumi asks. Before she can receive a question, Kashiwama's clone takes a deep breath as its throat bulges. Water style? Wild water wave. The clone expels out a violent torrent of water from its mouth, aimed right at them. We fight back. Kashiwama answers her question as he weaves his own chakra and slams his hands on the ground. Earth style? Earth wall. Casting the jutsu gives him a sharp pain in the forehead, causing him to flinch. The water crashes into the water and is unable to burst through, the earth simply absorbing it harmlessly. After barely a second of silence, the earth wall begins to hum and shake. Hifumi's eyes widen in recognition of the hum. Get back. She grabs Kashiwama by the shirt and pulls him away from the wall. His jutsu shatters to reveal the metal passing wires that had been embedded into it, vibrating with wind-style just. Once the earth wall breaks, Hifumi's clone sends the wires even further forward to wrap around them. Kashiwama's clone slams its hand on the ground, and Hifumi and Kashiwama feel the earth below them tremble. They lose their balance as the ground cracks and a wide structure appears directly behind them. Earth style? Earth wall. With their balance already shaken, they hit their backs against a copy of Kashiwama's jutsu. The wires lash out at them, but they manage to duck just in time as they hit the wall behind them and leave indents where they struck. Hifumi reaches into her pouch and takes out her own metal wires and whips them upward to wrap around the clones. She sends her wind style to course through them. Wind style? Sympathetic vibrations. The clones' wires snap in half, revealing them to actually be mud, as the parts that fell off crumble to the ground and turn to their semi-liquid state. The clone doesn't allow this to stop it, so it just continues lashing with the wires, using soil from the ground to supplement them and keep them growing. Hifumi does her best to keep up with the barrage, but it's visible she's struggling. Kashiwama begins forming hand signs. When I say jump, jump. He slams his hand on the ground. A rectangular plate under them begins shifting, only slightly forcing them to find their balance, and moves up. It comes up at an angle, meaning Kashiwama and Hifumi are being moved backward and up. Earth style? Ground bedrock. Usually a jutsu meant to create two press-like slabs of stone to crush enemies, this time it's used as a ramp. When the slab reaches its highest point, Kashiwama calls for them to jump, and they both do, using the ground bedrock as fast momentum to leap over the earth wall behind them and use it as cover to gain some distance. Kashiwama skids backward and looks on, prepared to act, but still very much not feeling well. Hifumi stands in front of him, wires ready. Kashiwama keeps coming to the rescue despite whatever's happening to him. I need to step up, I need to protect him so he can recover. Kashiwama smiles, noticing her clearly worried and focused expression. You don't need to worry about me, Hifumi. I'm fine. I can keep fighting. That doesn't mean you should. The clones both run around the earth wall at top speeds. Hifumi prepares her wires to slice through them and hopefully hold them off. Her clone uses its own wires, while Kashiwama's clone speeds forward with great speeds. Hifumi tries to stop the charging clone first, but her own doesn't allow her the freedom. Just when she wonders how she's going to take on both of them at once, while fighting both in close quarters and a range, Kashiwama's clone just runs right past her. As if she's not even present, the clone runs right for its original. It's going for Kashiwama her momentary distraction costs her as her clone attacks with greater intensity, not allowing her the chance to give aid. Kashiwama's clone delivers a solid punch that Kashiwama blocks with both hands, a kick that he blocks with his calf, a follow-up strike that he barely ducks out of the way of. Finally, a knee to the stomach that he can't avoid. He retches in pain as the air leaves him, leaving him in a coughing fit. The clone elbows him in the back to send him crumbling to the floor. Damn it. Kashiwama digs his fingers into the dirt, desperate to get back up. 
I can barely see anything, my head hurts so much. Why now, damn it. Hifumi acts. She resolves herself to help him, no matter what happens. She turns her back to her clone and focuses entirely on Kashiwama's clone, sending her metal wires to cut into its body and rend it to pieces. She grabs onto Kashiwama's clone's hand and rips them right off, then cuts at the legs, then the torso. With each wire enhanced with wind style, their cutting power is vastly increased. Her own clone obviously takes advantage of this and hits her across the back, each lash tearing her shirt and leaving her clothes slightly more soaked in blood. She fights through it. She keeps her focus where she feels it's needed most. To keep Kashiwama safe. He, on the other hand, has different priorities. As he gets his bearings back, he looks up to see Hifumi being attacked while defending him. From his position on the ground, he weaves his chakra and slams his hands. Earth style? Earth wall. The large structure juts out from the ground behind Hifumi and provides her with some much-needed cover. Kashiwama stands up to his feet and immediately runs forward. You keep him occupied, I'll take care of the other one. All right. She reluctantly agrees, realizing that splitting her attention twofold is not possible. When he passes by Hifumi he places a hand on her back as water gushes out from his palm to cover her body in a bubble of water. The water wobbles a bit before it straightens itself to a move cylindrical shape before the top spouts multiple branches in all directions. Even smaller bits of water emerge from those branches to now fully resemble a tree made completely of water. Medical water style? Oak. Hifumi's cuts and bruises begin to mend as the water focuses on her injuries. The cracking of earth can be heard from the other side of the wall, something very clearly and deliberately hitting Kashiwama's earth style. This is, medical ninjutsu? Hifumi stares in awe. Yeah. Kashiwama grins. I guess I haven't actually had the chance to show it off, huh? But I won't have time to heal all your injuries. That's fine, thank you. After only a cursory heal, Kashiwama takes his hand off Hifumi's back to cancel the medical ninjutsu and begins weaving his chakra in preparation. As he does, the earth wall finally breaks from the lashing it had been receiving until now, and he acts right away. Water style? Wild water wave. He shoots a jet of water from his mouth before the wall, even has the chance to fully crumble. He hits Hifumi's clone right on the chest and makes his way toward it, while Hifumi keeps focusing on Kashiwama's clone. Once the water dies down, Hifumi's clone stands back to its feet, wholly soaked and its form visibly washed away. It fights to pull itself back together and take back the form it's meant to have. You guys sure are focused on taking our form, huh? Is it that important to you? Kashiwama banters. Hifumi's clone runs forward, wires lashing out. Yeah, guess I shouldn't expect a conversation. While he's busy with that one, Kashiwama's clone is slowly piecing itself back together with Hifumi not being able to keep up with the cutting. It's almost as if the mud is getting more and more amorphous and her wires just slip right through. When it has something even vaguely resembling a humanoid form, it grabs the wires and tugs at them to try and yank them out of Hifumi's grasp. She tries to fight back against it, but after a brief tug-o-war, she loses out. The clone runs forward. The two prepare themselves to meet the clones head-on, but much to their surprise, the clones completely avoid them. They fight just as much as necessary to run past their opponents. Hifumi's clone runs past Kashiwama, and Kashiwama's clone runs past Hifumi. Kashiwama stares in surprise. She's not even trying to fight me, she's. Going for the original? Hifumi has the same exact thought. The originals run after the other's clone, but the surprise tactic left them at a slight disadvantage in catching up. The clones pass each other and intercept the originals. Hifumi manages to take out a spare set of metal wires to fight, and she tries to lash out at both clones, but her copy knocks each attempt away. Kashiwama tries to get past his clone, but they become locked in a taijutsu bout, with the original being at a clear disadvantage. No. Hifumi's mind begins racing. I have to do something, I have to come out on top. I'm a shinobi, too, damn it. Just because I'm from a smaller village doesn't mean I can't blast through any obstacle. She realizes something, kicked into action from her own words. Wait. Blast? With a large flourish, she knocks away her clone's wires and jumps back with a flip, in an attempt to distract from what she's actually doing. The clone regains its balance and continues this fight with wires, but quickly realizes its mistake. When Hifumi's wires get too close, something on them begins to glow and sizzle. Explosive tags, wrapped around the wires. They explode in a large cloud of black smoke that fills the entire area, including the two Kashiwamas. Seconds after, a figure runs out of the black cloud. For a moment, Hifumi prepares herself, but quickly recognizes the injured form of Kashiwama. 
Nice thinking. He gives a weak thumbs up. I don't know how well that worked, though. Get ready. The two jump back to get more distance and this time actually stick together since splitting doesn't seem to be working. When Kashiyama's clone and Hifumi's damaged clone emerge, they pelt them with more explosive tags before Hifumi uses her wind style to send them flying back. It's working, but Kashiwama winces. It's only holding them back a little bit. We need to regroup. Hifumi states. But I don't know where Genzai and Jiriki went to. We'll look for them or hope they find us. Let's make a big one, one giant smokescreen. Right. Kashiwama prepares several explosive tags strapped to kunai while Hifumi channels her chakra through her wires. When they have a visual on their targets, they act. Kashiwama throws the kunai and Hifumi sends her wires out vibrating. Wind style? Sympathetic vibrations. When the tags go off, the wind funnels intensify the explosion to create a much greater boom and larger smokescreen. By the time the mud golems reassemble themselves, Kashiwama and Hifumi are nowhere in sight. Meanwhile, Genzai Saratobi vs. Genzai. The clone lunges toward the original with blinding speed. It jumps and flips over Genzai, delivering a series of punches and kicks as it twists through the air. When it lands, it continues its barrage of low sweeps and spins, showing as much skill as the real thing. Genzai, however, is too familiar with this taijutsu to be so easily caught off guard. He jumps over and ducks under the typically unreadable movements of the Saratobi's monkey style. Damn. Genzai curses. It's copied my fighting style perfectly. I need some distance. As they engage in a series of quick jabs, shoulder barges, and kicks, none getting the upper hand over the other, Genzai manages to move his hand to his pouch. From it, he twirls two shuriken on his fingers and manages to cut his clone by using them as makeshift knuckles. With the clone momentarily dazed, he jumps back and throws the shuriken as intended. He reaches into the pouch on the thigh and pulls out a kunai this time, paper tag tied to it. He throws the kunai and the paper begins sizzling and blowing mid-air. It detonates in a massive explosion that creates a smokescreen between them. If only that would be enough to end this. In cases like this, Jiriki would be telling us where the enemy is, but he's got his own problems. So I gotta act right away. When the clone runs out of the dust cloud, intact, Genzai is already at the end stage of forming his hand signs. Fire style? Flame bomb. The clone goes out of the smoke and right into the fire as a stream of flames comes hurling right at it. The moment of calm that follows is quickly disrupted when the clone comes running at Genzai once more. Its appearance is slightly disheveled, and part of its body has returned to being mud, but it mends itself to appear human. Great, it can regenerate. The clone spreads its arms to the side as balls of mud form from its palms, taking on a flat shape and twisting into shuriken. It throws two of them and forms two new shuriken before its arms have even stopped from the motion of throwing the first two. It pelts Genzai with a seemingly never-ending supply of the weapons. Genzai does what he can to deflect them with his kunai, but far too many get through his defense for his liking. He becomes covered in scratches from the ones he barely dodges and stab wounds from the ones he doesn't. I need to regroup with the others soon, if only this guy would just let up. I think I can hear where Jiriki is. After a moment, the clone does stop throwing a rain of shuriken, and Genzai braces himself as he sees the final wave coming at him. He just needs to deflect those and he's good to go. His train of thought is halted when the clone starts weaving chakra. Shuriken shadow clones. Suddenly, the wave of shuriken flying at Genzai multiplies a dozenfold, and he knows full well he can't block all of them. Shit. Genzai is pelted by the wall of projectiles to the point of his own form, barely being recognizable under the shuriken stuck to him. His limp body falls back before he disappears in a puff of smoke, and a wooden log falls in his place. Substitution. To the side, Genzai wipes away the sweat off his brow, his clothes a bit more torn than a moment ago. To think it could use my jutsu. Genzai gets back to his feet. I had to take a few hits for that substitution, but it's better than the alternative. The clone rushes at him again, but Genzai is once again prepared. Fire style? Blazing meteors. Genzai breathes out several smaller balls of fire in rapid succession. A jutsu meant more to disorient and confuse than to damage, but that doesn't mean its power should be underestimated. The clone ducks, jumps, and weaves between the fire with amazing grace that makes Genzai wonder if this is how annoying he is to fight, as well. One well-placed and timed meteor does, however, hit the clone dead center. Genzai wastes no time with the follow-up. Every second not pelting it is a second it can use to recover. He throws more shuriken and kunai at it that manage to strike its body. 
The mud begins falling in the areas it's struck, but the mud already begins piecing itself back together. Before it can, one kunai begins sizzling, and the clone looks down to find an exploding tag embedded into its chest. Before it can react, the paper tag explodes and sends the clone's top half scattering all over the field. How do you like that? Genzai smirks. To the side, Dashin quietly observes and a twisted and amused smile. As if it's going to be that easy. He raises his hands in front of him to form a single hand sign. The clone begins reassembling itself by gathering soil from the ground. Genzai's eyes widen in surprise, but he has no time to be surprised. He reaches for his pouch and throws another exploding paper, hoping to completely eviscerate it. When this one strikes, however, before the tag explodes, the clone turns into a log that takes the explosion. From the corner of his eye, Genzai sees a hideous form ready to strike him. The mud golem remains in its incomplete form, as mud drips down from its body, but also slides up its body to repair it. Most of the torso remains an earthy brown color, while it tries to match the color of the real deal. Even while pulling itself together, the clone proves to be an overwhelming presence against an injured Genzai. He tries to keep up with its speed and use his taijutsu as best he can, but the clone does not let up. Where before they were an even match, now the clone keeps slowly taking initiative. A kick not blocked, a shove not guarded, a punch not dodged. With each strike against his already injured body, Genzai loses more and more ground until a decisive kick lands in his chest and sends him flying back into a tree. The clone remains in place to finalize its regeneration. Damn it. Genzai coughs up blood. This thing can do everything I can do, except it doesn't get tired and doesn't bleed. He wipes his bloodied mouth with his sleeve. I need to somehow take control, I need to. He glances down at his hand. Wait a minute, if it can't bleed, then it can't do everything I can. He looks up at his clone with a confident grin. Genzai smears blood on the palm of his hand and weaves his chakra before slamming his hand on the ground. Ninja art? Summoning. Dashin scowls. He can do that? That's one area where the mud golems are lacking. That's cheating, Genzai Saratobi. That's cheating. He grits his teeth. When the smoke from the summoning clears, Genzai stands side by side with his two monkey companions, Enki and Enka. The sister, Enka, takes in her surroundings and sees the two Genzai in front of him. Whoa, why's there two of you? The brother, Enki, looks up at the injured Genzai. Are you in danger? Genzai pants. I don't have time to explain, but that thing's a depelgenger of some kind, and I need your help to get rid of it. Ha. Huh. Enka chortles. You expect me to fall for that? What? Genzai looks at it in disbelief. Fall for what, sis? Enki asks. This thing just outed itself. Enka dramatically points to the real Genzai. How do we know you're not the Depelgenger? Enki gasps. You're right. Genzai blinks. What are you talking about? I summon you. And your ploy almost worked, Depelgenger. Enka crosses her arms with confidence that she's cracked the case. But we won't fall for it. That's right. Enki vigorously nods. No. It's even remotely right. Before Genzai can protest any further, a black flash runs in front of him. The clone took advantage of his distraction and ran at him to knee him right in the face. Genzai's head bounces back against a tree which stuns him for a moment, but a moment is all that's needed. The ringing in his ears and the throbbing pain in the back of his head make it difficult, if not impossible, to get his bearings back right away. Enki and Enka jump away on the next tree over and watch as one Genzai pummels another Genzai into oblivion. Genzai tries his best to block the punches, but it proves too much for him to handle. Ha! Enka sits down on the branch. Thought he could fool us. I don't know, Enka. Enki looks down at the slaughter with a worried expression. I think that was the real one. Hey, even if it is, so what? Enka cleans out the wax from the ear. That guy's always getting on our nerves, chasing us around like we owe him something. She watches Genzai fruitlessly defend himself. Genzai grabs a kunai and embeds it into the clone's hand, but it just passes through it like mud. He's not even a very good summoner. Enka's voice trails off as she watches this going on, her tone becoming less and less indignant. The clone reaches down and grabs the kunai Genzai just tried to defend himself with. He's just a dumb kid. Enka's voice turns to a whisper. The clone steps on Genzai's chest and swings with the kunai. Genzai grabs the foot and tries to push it away, but his strength proves insufficient. While his mind races for a solution, while he begins wondering if this is how he's going to end, Enki leaps forward and grabs the clone's kunai holding hand. By twisting his body around and kicking with all of his strength, the arm is completely severed and turns to mud in Enki's grip. 
Benka jumps right in front of the clone and kicks him in the head, chest, and stomach. As she lands on the ground, she jumps up and delivers a double kick that sends the clone flying away. Enki and Enka stand guard in front of Genzai. You too. Genzai manages a whisper. We got your back. Enki declares. You might be a dumb brat, but you're our dumb brat, damn it. Genzai laughs. You two are impossible to deal with. Dashin stops out of his observing spot. That's not fair. This was supposed to be one-on-one. -on -one. Not fair? Genzai stands up with some difficulty, using the tree as support. You're the one hiding behind these puppets. Using underhanded tricks to win, but you made one miscalculation. And what's that? You didn't know who you're dealing with. Genzai glares. Enki and Enka jump up and each grasp onto Genzai's hand, with a wide grin. A smokescreen follows that's very quickly cleared by a violent spinning motion. Genzai stands there, holding onto two black sticks with a golden top, attaches with a chain to another stick that's whirling violently enough to rip off the leaves from the branches above. With a flourish, Genzai stops the spinning and rests his new weapons under his arms. Transformation? Adamantine Ninchaku. My name is Genzai Saratobi. He declares. I'm the grandson of the third Hakage and future heir of the Saratobi clan. You'll carry that name to the afterlife, you bastard. Dashin hisses and runs forward, finally joining the fight. The clone weaves its chakra and takes a deep breath before exhaling a sea of flames. Fire style? Fire dragon flame bomb. Let's go, Enki, Enka. Right, yeah. Genzai runs forward, directly at the massive incoming flame, much to Dashin's surprise and shock. He holds out one of the ninchaku in front of him and spins it with even greater intensity than before. The flames are fanned away by the strength of Enki's adamantine form and don't even reach them. When Dashin runs toward him, seeing that the initial idea failed, but the result is still the same. Genzai is distracted by the fire. He thinks that by coming at him from the side that'll give him an opening, but he's wrong. Genzai swings his second ninchaku which would normally completely miss. Dashin sees the attack coming a mile away and steps back to avoid direct contact. Or so he thinks. Suddenly, the ninchaku's stick expands to a much greater size, more resembling a great club than anything, and slams into his side. He's caught completely unprepared and is sent flying away. The clone runs at Genzai, the mud that forms its body morphing to create its own ninchaku, but it can't even begin to compare to the real deal. Genzai turns the tide by completely rendering the clone unable to get near him. With the monkey clan's ability to shift their size in adamantine form, Genzai continuously changes the size of his ninchaku, making them completely unreadable and unpredictable. He slams away at the clone's arms, chest, head, and try as it might to keep up with the assault, it's far too overwhelming. Incoming? Behind us, Enka warns him. From the corner of his eyes, he turns around just in time to see Dashin slam his hands on the ground, face contorted in anger. Even though the top half of his face is covered by the black mask, the scowl tells everything one needs to know. Forbidden Jutsu? Fire rats cometh. The ground underneath him is set ablaze as dozens of small forms emerge from the inferno and leap right at Genzai. On closer inception, they all look like some inflaming rats. He turns around, judging that it'll take a while for the clone to regenerate, and swats away at the fiery rodents, causing them to burst into ashes. Ow! Enka cries out in pain. That hurt. That actually hurt. What? On hearing this, Genzai stops spinning the adamantine ninchaku and dodges the fire rats instead. It hurt your adamantine form? It did. Enki confirms. This isn't normal fire jutsu. Then let's try this. Genzai tucks the ninchaku away for a moment to free up his hands. Fire style? Blazing meteors. Choosing to literally fight fire with fire, he sends out motes of fire jutsu of his own to intercept the fire rats, but even that doesn't fully work. Whatever this jutsu is, it's stronger than his own. While he runs around to avoid them, he does notice something peculiar. Dashin is far too out of breath for someone who hasn't actually done much. As he's resting in the circle of fire, he's forming a hand sign that one may think is to maintain the fire, but it's actually stopped spouting fire rats, so that's most likely not it. Rather, the clone is regenerating at a faster rate than before. So. Those things aren't self-sufficient, after all. Enki, Enka, get ready. We're getting out of here. You summoned us just to run away? Enka protests. It's a tactical retreat. He corrects her. Fire style? Fire dragon flame bomb. This time he spits out a much larger flame and turns his head around to make sure it covers as wide of an area as it possibly can. Everything in the vicinity is set aflame except for the rats which were already set aflame. 
Even this more powerful fire style isn't enough to stop their assault, but something else does. The lack of a target. When the fire dies down, Genzai is nowhere to be seen. Dashin frantically looks around as Genzai's clone fully heals itself and hits the ground with his fist. Don't think you can run away. If I can't get you, I'll just get your friends. Meanwhile, Jiriki Hugo versus Jiriki. Jiriki wastes absolutely no time wondering what to do. As soon as the clone takes one step toward him, he draws his bow and conjures arrows from the seals etched onto the bow. He looses arrow after arrow at the charging clone. The clone knocks away each arrow that comes flying its way by releasing a burst of chakra from its palms. One blow. Hand. It's slightly different from what Jiriki normally does, though, it looks more violent, like it's releasing more chakra than normal. It looks unrefined. So it doesn't just copy your appearance, but your abilities. This could be annoying. Jiriki analyzes the situation. But, something's off. By Akugin. The veins around his eyes pop as his vision enhances, giving him what he needs to scope out his opponent and his allies. Right now, though, he has to focus on the enemy in front of him. He takes a closer look at the mud golem's body and notices an oddity, while still continuing to loose arrows. It doesn't have a chakra network. It can use chakra and jutsu despite this irregularity. Is that why its one blow seems so sloppy? Our jutsu relies on releasing chakra from our chakra points, but it doesn't have any. It's just flailing its chakra around. This could be my key to ending this, so I can go to Kashiwama and Genzai. The clone, having had enough of this, morphs its own hand to form a bow. It places a hand on the bow's stock, and more mud emerges from it to form an arrow. It knocks and looses just as Jiriki does. So it can do that, too. But it doesn't seem like it can copy my storage seals. Good. Arrows clash with mud arrows as the two trade shots at each other. The projectiles perfectly clash into each other, as the clone uses this opportunity to get closer to its target. Several arrows manage to pass through on each side, but are dodged well enough. Jiriki has a few close calls where the arrows pass through his hair and tear his robes, but the clone doesn't seem to even care. It takes the arrows head on and lets them slip through its muddy body. Having a foe not react the way one normally would is very disorienting and makes planning your next step more difficult. While he considers his options, Jiriki notices something odd about the next arrow that comes his way. The chakra inside is violently whirling and twisting to the point of looking like it's about to explode. Can't let that one near me. Jiriki conjures a different arrow from the ones he'd been conjuring until one. One of his special trick arrows, with a container wrapped around just under the arrowhead. He releases it at the unstable mud arrow, and the container bursts open to release a net that spreads over a white area and threatens to wrap around the incoming arrows. Before it can, however, the clone's arrow bursts itself into a massive gust of wind that knocks away Jiriki's arrow and even knocks back Jiriki himself. The large funnel sends him flying back, but he manages to get to his feet after tumbling and rolling on the ground for a second. That was, vacuum palm? With the arrow as its source? Jiriki bites his lip. I guess that makes sense. If it created the arrows from its mud body, then the arrows are technically a part of its body. How annoying. The clone finally closes in the distance and jabs Jerky with its open palm. Jeriki regains his composure and takes his stance, dropping the longbow on the ground, as it's now a burden more than anything. The two exchange blows with chakra gathered at their fingertips, the deadly gentle fist. To the naked eye, it looks like a simple exchange of blows, but a trained eye knows how devastating only a single strike can be. Both Jeriki and the clone move with great precision, parrying or dodging one another's blows, while trying to land a hit of their own. Even though the clone doesn't have a chakra network that Jiriki can exploit, which is why the gentle fist is so feared, he does have his ways to fight this being. By releasing his chakra in a smaller more concentrated version of one blow. Hand, he's able to blow off chunks of the clone's body, sending pieces of earth and mud flying each time their hands meet. It's not the best scenario for him, but he has to work with what he has. Similarly, the clone's lack of a chakra network is working slightly against it as well. Because it can't focus its chakra with needle light precision, it can't completely target Jiriki's chakra points to close them. Its strikes still hurt, but they deal more blunt trauma than anything. The two move like water, each strike, each kick executed with finesse. There's one element of the Hyuga clan's gentle fist that not many people talk about, but it's also something that not many can master, either. In addition to just closing people's chakra networks, a well-trained Byakugan can spot the chakra composition of a released jutsu and completely negate it. A well-trained Hyuga can use their gentle fist and turn a fire style. 
fireball jutsu into a harmless ember by using their gentle fists to remove chakra from the equation. He knows for a fact that Lord Hiyashi and Lady Hinata are able to do it, he's not sure about Lady Hinabi. That's precisely what Yuriki has been trying to do this entire battle and why he's sticking to Tai Jutsu against this entity. He's hoping to manage to perform this technique and render this so-called mud golem, but he's not any closer to actually getting it. They gradually pick up speed in an attempt to outmaneuver the other, but after a couple minutes of purely trying to outperform each other with Tai Jutsu, Jiriki notices a change in the fight that's not to his favor. This thing. It's not getting tired. My body's starting to get sore, but this clone is showing no signs of damage. Does it not get tired? No, it's made of mud, of course it wouldn't. Time for a change of pace. Jiriki concentrates as much chakra to his entire arm as he can and unleashes it when he manages to get a clean hit in. One blow. Arm. The sudden burst of energy throws the clone off its balance enough for Jiriki to bring his arms back and wind up for a follow-up attack. Vacuum palm. With a thrust of his arms, Jiriki sends his clone flying. Before it can even realize it was sent back, Jiriki runs to grab his bow. If it can't actually copy his equipment, then the storage seals are going to be a lifesaver. As soon as he picks it up, he conjures an arrow and fires from a kneeling position. Just as before, a metal container bursts open while the clone is still recovering, and the net threatens to wrap it. Before it even impacts, Jiriki runs into the trees to use them as cover. The clone doesn't let itself be deterred. It gathers chakra over its entire body and unleashes it in a massive burst. One blow. Body. The wave of raw chakra pushes the net away. From his hiding spot within the forest, Jiriki takes a moment to compose himself before getting another arrow. He carefully aims right for the head and releases. Before it can get too far, the clone whips around and once again forms a bow and arrow from the mud it's made of. With the veins around its eyes popped and its eyes as focused as ever, it shoots its own arrow and intercepts Jiriki's. With its biakugan it stares directly at Jiriki. It can even copy Keke Genkai? Change of plans. Jiriki runs further away from the clone, hoping to put some distance between them and shoot from outside of the Byakugan S range, but that means he'll have to have visual while the clone doesn't. It's not a likely scenario, but he has to make it work. Thankfully, Jiriki knows exactly what the range of his Byakugan is, so he knows how to maneuver around it and stay out of sight. They exchange several more shots while the clone tries to catch up, but Jiriki constantly skirts around the edge of the Byakugan S range and manages to keep himself hidden. The clone soon grows agitated with this game of cat and mouse and fires arrows in random directions, each bursting with raw chakra. Jiriki avoids all of them. After a minute or so of skulking tactics, the clone finds something. Two arrows come consecutively from the same spot, although the aim is very far off, so it runs in that direction in search for its original. What it finds instead is a device mounted to a tree. It's a cylindrical contraption mounted to a tree that's covered in jutsu formula. After several seconds, the formula glow and conjure an arrow that shoots forward. It's an automated seal, designed to release its contents one at a time. The power is nothing even remotely close to actually firing with a bow, but as a distraction, it's doing wonders. The clone growls in anger and stomps over to the device to tear it down and break it in its frustration, but before it can reach, something hits it in the back. A sudden jolt of electricity runs through its body and renders it momentarily stunned. It falls to its knees despite its best efforts to to fight back. Through its biakigan, it sees another arrow come right for it, but it can't move fast enough to do anything about it. As soon as it hits, it also releases an electrical current. That's another thing that Jiriki is more than familiar with about the biakigan the weak spot. The clone may not have noticed, or even have the capacity to notice, that there's a tiny sliver in the back that the biakigan can't see. A single spot, a blemish, in the Dejutsu's supposed perfect 360 degrees visual radius. It takes a moment for it to overcome the stunning effect. It rips the arrows off with a loud roar, but another arrow comes flying right into its head. This one, however, does not release a jolt. It explodes. The entire upper half of the clone breaks apart and scatters across the area, giving Jiriki some time to breathe. I never thought I'd have to exploit this weakness myself, on myself. He muses but it looked like the arrows only worked for a bit. I figured I'd give it a shot since it's earth style, but I guess I really would need an actual lighting style. There's little time to celebrate victory. As he steps closer, he sees the clone's chakra already working to mend it. It actively gathers more soil from the ground to repair itself. Jiriki stops in his tracks and looks back to where they previously came from, where they were split up. At the absolute range of his vision, he sees movement. 
he sees his teammates gathering together and with his enemy temporarily disabled, now's his chance to regroup and think of a more permanent solution. Team 5 vs. Team 5 when Kashiwama and Hifumi emerge from the ground not far from where this whole mess originally started, they don't actually have to wait long to find their friends. Genzai and Jiriki arrive next to them almost simultaneously, both worse for wear. Genzai kneels down beside them with his ninchaku in his hands, while Jiriki already has his bow out and ready to fire. Jiriki looks around his teammates, noting their scars and overall ragged appearance. You look terrible. Genzai glances over to his bruised body, his whole arms and even his chest turned blue and purple from the beating he received. Like you're one to talk. Hifumi notes Genzai's ninchaku that he has ready to strike out at any time. Those look cool. Abruptly, an eye sprouts from one of the ninchaku stick, and a tiny fuzzy hand emerges from the side to wave at her. Thanks. I'm pretty awesome, aren't I? Hifumi lets out a startled yelp before she places her hands over her mouth. It can talk. Of course I can. How rude. A second tiny arm emerges for the sole purpose of crossing them in annoyance. Kashiwama raises a brow. Are those Enki and Enka? The other ninchaku sprouts an arm of its own and waves to Kashiwama. Hey, send you kiddo. So you finally got them under control, huh? Jiriki smirks. Hey. Enka swings her fist at him. No one gets us under control you got that? We just felt sorry for the kid, is all. We don't really have time to argue. Genzai interrupts their banter. You're right. Kashiwama agrees and slams his hands on the ground. Medical water style? Forest. With no time to waste, Kashiwama activates his wide-range healing. The ground under them become covered in an ankle-high layer of water, as some wisps of water rise up their bodies like vines to heal their injuries. Kashiwama cries out in pain as he does. You shouldn't be using your chakra so much. Hifumi protests. I gotta. Kashiwama says through gritted teeth. We have to beat these guys. And get to Shino-sensei. What even happened to you? Genzai asks. I don't know, but. Kashiwama looks in the direction of the hidden moon village. I think I know. Do you know or not know? Jiriki argues. Okay, now's not the time. Genzai interjects. We have something more important to do. My clone shouldn't be far behind me. I don't suppose you all have ideas. I don't know if it helps, Hifumi speaks up, but these golems seem to be overly focused on their original. Kashiwama's look-alike barely bothered with me. Yeah. Same. Kashiwama nods. We might be able to use their focus to our advantage. Maybe. Genzai thinks things over. Apparently these mud golems can heal themselves, but the caster can speed up the process and the expense of their own chakra. If we can get them to enough of a beaten down start, we can force Dashin to use up even more of his chakra. Jiriki finally adds. I didn't really learn much besides that these things don't have a chakra network. When it comes to manipulating raw chakra, like for my 8 trigrams, they're unable to do it right. It comes out unstable. Then how can they use elemental ninjutsu? Genzai questions. I don't know how these things work. They're weird enough as is. Either way, my gentle fist can't even work on them because they don't have chakra points. They don't have. Kashiwama mutters to himself before speaking up. So their chakra is just running wild in their bodies? Something like that, yeah. Jiriki answers. Then I might have a way to put them down for good. But I can barely even see straight with this headache. Kashiwama gives them an affirming nod. If they're too focused on the original, then that leaves us with an opening we can take advantage of. We'll need to have each other's backs like never before. At the sound of this, Hifumi's hands begin to slightly tremble. These guys have been amazing, and Genzai and Jiriki apparently were able to overcome their copies all on their own. They've been together for years and have had time to work on their teamwork while she's never really had the. It's fine. Kashiwama places a hand on her arm. You got this handled, okay? You cut up my clone pretty good. I know we can work together. She gives a light smile. Yeah. Jiriki prepares an arrow from his storage seal. Hifumi uses metal wires, so her clone should, too. I might be able to tangle her up. Genzai looks to Hifumi. While he does that, can you take care of mine? If it's mine, he'll use shuriken or fire style. Got it. She nods. Enki, Enka, when I say go, I want you to return. I'm going to need every single bit of chakra I have for this. You got it. Okay. The two revert fully to ninchaku form. So I guess that leaves me with Jiriki's clone. Kashiwama says. And me, with yours. Genzai adds. With their roles set, Kashiwama cancels his medical ninjutsu, leaving the water to settle into the ground. They don't have to wait long at all. Their clones emerge from the forest pretty much at the same time, 
and because Team 5 moved further back, it'll be difficult to split them apart like before. The clones are all coming in from the same direction, so it should be a simple matter to go at them together. The clones' bodies all morph to create weapons that match what their originals wield. Bow and arrows for Jiriki, metal wires for Hifumi, shuriken for Genzai, and kunai for Kashiwama. The real Jiriki, Hifumi, and Kashiwama fire back with the same weapons, but Genzai fights with Enki and Enka. The field in front of them becomes filled with flying projectiles, some of them clashing mid-air, some whizzing past their targets. The ones that do manage to fly through are swatted away by the adamantine ninchaku. With each swing of the transformed monkeys, they momentarily grow in size when in front of the group, and when they swing back, they shrink down. It always looks as if Genzai is going to hit either Kashiwama or Jiriki, but the two don't flinch at all, and the ninchaku whoosh past them as they become smaller. Hifumi can't help but be impressed at how much these three trust in each other, the training they must have gone through to get to where they are. She resolves herself to do better and to not be in their way in this fight. As the clones slowly move closer, inching their weight toward the originals, they switch up the strategy. Rather than just throwing projectiles, they begin weaving their chakra. Enki, Enka, go. Genzai gives the command, and the two summons return home. A fire-style firebomb is deflected by Jiriki's vacuum palm. A water-style wild water wave is deflected by Kashiwama's earth-style earth dragon mud bomb. They counter the clone's jutsu and get closer and closer where it turns into a tai jutsu fight. Once again, Team 5 show teamwork as they gracefully go over and around each other to block and deflect the enemy's strikes away. It's not just each other's attacks that they're reading, though. They're also perfectly dancing around Hifumi's wire jutsu as if they've practiced this before. They fight like a well-oiled machine until the exact right moment comes to them. As if in a dance, Team 5 lead their enemy to just the spot they need to be for the definitive attack. When they line up as they should, Genzai is the first to act. He turns to Kashiwama's clone and spews fire directly in its face. Fire style? Fire dragon flame bomb. Genzai's clone turns to Genzai and takes a deep breath and turn. Just as it spews out fire, multiple wires vibrating with wind style surround it. Wind style? Wind cage. Hifumi's wind style creates funnels of air that redirect the fire style and trap the clone in a cage of infernal fire. When Hifumi's clone sends out its wires, Jiriki fires a trick arrow, one that releases a wide net to ensnare them and the clone. When the clone becomes trapped, Jiriki releases a volley of electrified arrows. Lastly, while Jiriki's clone aims at the original, Kashiwama moves in. The clone notices this and tries to send him away with a burst of chakra, but what Kashiwama does catches even his allies by surprise. He channels his chakra into a liquid tree that completely surrounds Jiriki's clone. Medical water style? Oak. Genzai spews out fire with great intensity, his cheeks puff out as far as they can and turn red from strain. I have to burn it. I have to harden it. Hotter. I need to make my flames hotter. Use up every single bit of chakra I have left. The fire begins to gradually shift color. The more chakra he puts into it, the more he focuses, the hotter the flames get. More. The red fire turns to orange. More. The orange turns brighter and brighter into yellow. More. The yellow glows until it becomes a blinding white that incinerates the grass and leaves in front of him. Kashiwama's clone tries to reach out of the fire, but its body begins turning into clay. Hifumi redirects her wires in such a way to amplify Genzai's clone's fire even further, to reach a level of heat that doesn't quite reach what Genzai himself is dishing out, but it comes close. She closes in the cage to make it as small as possible, as the fire whirls inside like a hellish tornado. With a flick of her wrists, the wires cut through the clone like a net and split it into dozens of smaller hardened pieces. Jiriki runs to his temporarily incapacitated target with his Byakugan intently staring into its form. If I'm ever going to do it, it has to be now. I can't let myself fall back from these guys. Come on, focus, focus. He pours as much chakra as he can into his dejutsu, forcing it to home in on specific parts of the mud golem's structure. Until he finally sees it. The structure of the jutsu, the chakra makeup of not just what the clone is using, but how the clone itself was created. It's brief, but he sees what he needs to. He places his two palms on the torso and swiftly runs one hand up and one hand down. 8 trigrams? Disruption. The clone splits and crumbles to the ground. Kashiwama keeps his grip on his medical ninjutsu, despite Jiriki's clone's attempt to break through it. It ties to use the Hyuga clan's signature ninjutsu, but it keeps falling short of bursting the oak. Jiriki said it's too rough, and each attempt becomes more and more unstable, until it can no longer even hold its form. 
Kashiwama pushes the jutsu over, and Jiriki's clone fall, complete dissolving turns into a pile of mud. With that, they all take a moment. Genzai collapses on the ground out of breath, along with Kashiwama who's looking even worse than before. Is it? Over? Hifumi asks, hopeful. Not yet. Jiriki states as he looks around with his Byakugan. But it will be soon. He flickers away with no warning. Somewhere to the side, Dashin is kneeling and kneading his chakra. Damn it. They did too much damage. I need to repair them, I need to get them back in fighting shape. He's sweating and panting as if he himself had just been through the hardest battle of his life. When he looks up in anger, he barely even has enough time to register the palm that's headed right for his face. Palm bottom. Jiriki sends a burst of chakra that shatters his black mask and sends him falling like a log. When he walks out into the clearing with an unconscious Dashan, the group can finally call this battle a win. Now it's over. Jiriki flashes a cocky smirk that's slightly ruined by his state of disrepair. Kashiwama rolls over on his back and looks to Genzai with a wide smile. That was the hottest fire I've seen you do. Genzai tries to laugh, but what comes out is a pained cough. Yeah. I'm out of chakra, though. I don't think I can make a simple clone at this point. What did you do, though? Jiriki asks Kashiwama as he joins them, dragging Dashin behind. How did you destroy that thing with medical ninjutsu? I kinda had an idea. When you said they don't have a chakra network. Medical ninjutsu also needs the patient to have some kind of stability. Doesn't. Doesn't have to be a chakra network, but it needs to be stable. He pauses for a moment to get his breath back. Medical ninjutsu. Uses the patient's own body to help with the healing, but when I tried to heal the clone. Your ninjutsu couldn't find anything stable. It kept searching, but it couldn't find it. Kashiwama nods and pushes himself up. I tried to bring order into chaos. Chaos didn't know what to do with itself. Hifumi sits down and looks between all of them. You guys are. Seriously amazing. Genzai lifts a hand to give her a thumbs up. You did pretty damn good, too. Now, what do we do with this guy? Jiriki asks. If he's apparently a traitor, then is Shinga, too? Sounded like it. Genzai says. Just, give me a minute and I'll get back to my feet. Looks like we've got to leave this to Sensei. Kashiwama shakes his head. I can't do that. Jiriki raises a brow. What do you mean you can't do that? Kashiwama stares in the direction the hidden moon is. I have to get to it. It's calling to me. That's what the headache was. I couldn't really make it out, but now I know. It needs my help. Jiriki blinks twice. What are you talking about? Without saying anything else, Kashiwama flickers away. They all stare in disbelief. Oh I. Jiriki calls out to the ether. Get back here. Why? Did he leave? Hifumi asks. I don't know. He sounded crazy. Genzai looks to them for confirmation. He sounded crazy, right? I'm going after him. Jiriki starts walking in the direction he ran off to. Oh, not you, too. Genzai falls back to the ground. If you go, you're on your own. I can't move a muscle. Hifumi nervously looks between them. I, I don't think it'd be a good idea to leave Genzai behind. That's fine. You two stay behind and rest. I'll get that knucklehead back. With that, Jiriki flickers away in pursuit of his friend. Hidden Moon Village Shino is finding himself at somewhat of a disadvantage. With the aid of his Kakechu, he's flying high above other building in the village, close to the peak of the massive red tree, but he can't actually get close. There's some kind of red mist that's being released by the tree and surrounds the top, something that seems to resemble pollen, which instantly kills any of his parasitic insects that get too close. He's tried to send them through any angle he could find, but the pollen encompasses the entire area. What he's taken to doing instead, after some trial and error and losing a lot of kakechu, is to attack the roots. At least, the ones that are freshly sprouted and have just planted themselves into the ground. The ones that were first planted into the ground and have been pumping something for the longest, are far too toxic for the kakechu. The newer ones apparently haven't had time to develop whatever toxins they develop, and so Shino can more easily work on them. Bug bite. The kakechu burrow into the roots and enlarge to human size to eat away at them, which is where the moon shinobi take over after overcoming their aversion and realizing the giant insects are allies. Thankfully the number of threats has decreased. They have to worry about the roots and some of their fellow shinobi suddenly turning on them while being visibly possessed by something. Due to reasons unknown to them, the mud de Pelgingers all just melted away with no explanation, and they're hoping they stay that way. Shino is doing his best to coordinate the attacks from afar by commanding his kakechu. From time to time, 
He also places a hand on the gourd on his back to check on the insects inside and see if they're ready yet. Soon. The red tree's top twists and bends to allow one specific branch to rise upward to be eye level with the hovering Shino. At the top of the branch, he can see a man seemingly fused with the tree, a man whose skin has taken on more of a bark-like appearance, whose veins are showing with their sickly red coloration. Shingo laughs. You're too late, Shino Aburama. Far too late. You. Shino cocks his head. I know you. I figured you would. I presume you're Shibi Aburama's son, yes? Being annoying know-it-alls runs in the family. Shinga the unrestrained, of the hidden stone village. I thought Hakui was a threat, but in reality he was working with you all along. I recognized the markings on his mask. Jibaku, a forbidden jutsu that controls other people's actions. Ah, so my infamy hasn't dwindled. That's good to know. He bows in a mocking manner before adding with a mumble. Never did like that name, though. Why are you in the hidden moon? What do you hope to gain from this? Shinga spreads his arms to motion to the chaos surrounding them. Isn't that quite clear? Once the Jubako has drunk enough blood, it'll be able to absorb the Gashinboku. With their powers, I'll have powers at my disposal to rival the Divine Tree of the Fourth War. What do you know about the Gashinboku and this Jubako? How are they connected to the Divine Tree? Shino once again reaches back to touch the gourd on his back. Not yet. The central branches of the Jubako wrap themselves even tighter around the very top of the tower. Their forms tightly squeeze an invisible cube that Shino recognizes as the barrier that keeps the Gashinboku hidden away from view and protected from external forces. Truthfully I don't know how they relate, just that they do. Whatever they are, they're opposing forces. Shinga explains with a shrug. The Gashinboku strengthens and nurtures while the Jubako weaks and ruins. That's why we were able to weaken the Gashinboku with extract from the Jubako seed, you see. And you just happened to come across this information? Something that apparently no one else knew of. Shinga cackles. What can I say, I'm very thorough. There were stories, old wives' tales of an entity that once roamed the land and fed on suffering and misery. That's the Jubako. It digs deep into the ground and feeds on the remnant energy, on the blood spilled. The more people have died in a given area, the stronger it becomes. That's why. I'm grateful you asked. It allowed me to stall. The barrier ninjutsu shatters under the might of the Jubako's branches. The Gashinboku becomes visible to those outside of the tower, although even then the fierce red tree has surrounded it so much that hardly anyone is able to actually see it. This time, unfortunately for the people of the moon, the Gashinboku does not come to their aid. The Gashinboku is mine. Shinga proclaims as he sends out a branch to lash at the opposing white tree. Not just yet. Shino calmly states. The branch cracks apart to reveal a giant insect eating away at it from the inside. Bug bite. The kakechu flies from the eaten branch to the next, seemingly unfazed by the necrotic chakra of the red tree. Shinga glares at Shino. You. You see, Shino explains, you weren't the only one stalling for time. I'd like to thank you for clarifying two things for me. One, that the Jubako does indeed share a connection to the divine tree and two, that it's the source of the poison. And how would any of that even be useful to you, you brat? Shinga growls. You see, I'd already bred Kakechu whose sole purpose is to survive the chakra of the divine tree, and just recently I had two Kakechu die, I suspect, after ingesting Hakui's poisonous substance. And I've been breeding Kakechu to resist it. Shino finally reaches back and unseals the gourd on his back. Swarms of Kakechu fly out right into the red mist. This time, none of them fall. Insects fear. They all latch onto the branch and dig inside to avoid the, the thrashing and slamming of the branches. Shinga's attempt to shake them off or squish them, whichever comes first. This hive is immune to the Jubako. Shino declares. He spreads his arms to command his swarms to move out. A portion of them emerge from the branches to spread out to the roots and branches that have taken hold further into the village. The Kakechu he'd been using until now did a valiant job, but even they couldn't hold up to the corruption. These are now able to eat away at even the stronger, more poisonous roots, although it takes them time. You think this is enough? You're just stalling again, you know this won't stop me. Shinga cries out. I have spent too much time preparing for this moment to allow a brat like you to get in my way. You should have prepared better. Shinga continues to thrash the Jubako's branches about to rid himself of the burrowing insects, while also lashing out at the hovering Shino. He manages to fly out of the way of most strikes, but some he doesn't outspeed, which is when the Kakechu fly out to his aid to create a shield. Some take too much damage from the impact and fall dead to the ground. The Jubako's branches and roots continue to grow weaker as the Kakechu slowly eat at them from the inside out, keeping the sacred tree safe in the process. 
The tree is no longer able to absorb energy from the ground at the same rate. The Goshenboku is right there. Shingle laments. I just need time to absorb it. If only I could get these bugs to leave the Jubako alone. Wait. I just might be able to. Now that Shinga is fused with the Jubako, their chakras are one and the same. They are one entity. The Kakechu are just in contact with the tree's chakra, they're in contact with his own, and as long as they're in contact with his chakra, Jubaku, the markings appear on his forehead, as if being burned directly on his skin. The thrashing stops. The Jubako's roots and branches regenerate and now they're not being stopped. Shino looks at his surroundings, confused. What? Shinga's laughter fills the air around them. You miscalculated. You miscalculated, Shino Aburama. Your insects are immune to the Jubako, but they're not immune to me. Attack him, my minion. The Kakechu all leave their burrows and fly directly toward Shino. He tries to exert his control over them, but it's futile, he's left with no choice but to run from his own insect. Shinga now has all the freedom he needs. Once again, he sends out a branch to dig into the ground at the Goshenboku's base. This time there's no beetles to drain his power and eat away at the branches. This time there's nothing to stop him. Earth style? Ground bedrock. Just before the branch can reach the sacred tree, two slabs of earth shift from the ground below and rise upward like a press to crash into the branch. Kashiwama jumps up from behind the Goshenboku and lands right in front of it in a defensive pose. I'm here. I'll protect you. He says to seemingly no one. Kashiwama? Shino says in surprise. You have to get away. It's too dangerous. He calls out to his student. No, I have to be here. Kashiwama calls back. I'm telling you to go. Shino stops running and turns around to face his own Kakechu. I can't afford to run around anymore. He sends out the insects still under his control to combat the ones Shinga placed under his Jibaku. While they fight, Shino makes a break for the Goshenboku to protect both it and his pupil. Shinga, however, has other plans. Now that the insects immune to the Jubako are no longer a threat, he can freely spread his pollen to block Shino's path and keep him at bay. You're good, boy, I've seen it. Shinga addresses Kashiwama, but you're not nearly good enough. Another branch lashes out. Earth style? Earth wall. Kashiwama rides the rising earth upward and jumps up once the branch collides and breaks it. Water style? Wild water wave. He shoots a torrent of water to blow away the assaulting branch and the ones coming right after it. Shino manages to connect with several of his kakechu that happened to not be in contact with Shinga when he cast his mind-controlling jutsu. He still has a fighting force, they just need to get here in time. Before Kashiwama can land, another branch lashes out. Faster than he can anticipate, faster than he can defend against. It hits him directly and sends him crashing against the Goshenboku. Kashiwama, Shino panics. It's over. Shinga sends one final branch. Kashiwama is crushed against the trunk of the sacred tree, coughing up blood. I'm not gonna give up. I have to protect it. Has to be me. Blood trickles down the white tree's bark, seeping into the roots. Shino sends out his immune Kakechu in a rage to chip away at the red tree and reach Kashiwama, but the Jubako is already strengthened. It swats them away and leaves no room for them to break through to get to the Goshenboku. Kashiwama, Shino calls out once more in desperation. So it was this easy to reduce you to an incoherent mess, Shino Aburama? Shinga mocks. You're far too soft. A jolt runs through his spine, leaving him dazed for a moment. Shinga begins breathing heavier, his hands stiff and shaking. What's going on? Just then, large white roots emerge from the ground and envelop the red roots of the Jubako. They dig into and pierce the Jubako's bark, chipping away at its massive form. From the tower and all throughout the village, wherever the red roots threaten the hidden moon village, the white emerge to defend it. Is this, the Goshenboku? Shino whispers. But how? No. 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 Shinga exclaims. There's no way it has any strength left. We poisoned it for years. He retches and coughs up blood, his form beginning to weaken, and his connection to the Jubako severing. The vibrant red coloring turns paler by the second. Shino spends no time deliberating. His Kakechu fly directly toward Shinga while he's confused and weak. Infestation. The Kakechu burrow into his skin and eat away at him from the inside. Shinga screams in pain as he's no longer unable to do anything. The bark that's fused to his skin breaks apart and he begins falling down, tumbling onto the trunk and branches. Shino flies right past him, only faintly hearing his death throes stop as the Kakechu end him. 
the Jubako slowly withers away under the overwhelming power of the Gashinboku, and now that he can pass, Shino sees the Gashinboku itself beginning to lose its bright colors and turns a sickly, ashy gray. As the Jubako dies, so too does the Gashinboku. However, right now, he has but one concern. He hovers to the bottom of the tree where he sees it's grown much thicker, mostly likely as a secondary defensive wall. He tears it apart to look for Kashiwama, splinters digging into his fingers and nails turning black, but he doesn't even notice. Right now, the only thing on his mind is Kashiwama. He easily enough breaks the brittle wood and finds Kashiwama fused with the base of the Gashinboku. He arrives just in time to catch a glimpse of some light green markings fade away from Kashiwama's face, as the boy stands unconscious but upright, forming a hand sign. The sacred tree has wrapped a branch around his body to protect him, and sap is dripping over his wounds. The very last healthy remnant of the Gashinboku is protecting and healing him. Shino looks over the unconscious boy, looks at the pose he's in, and then back to the roots of the Gashinboku, which are also beginning to wither. Kashiwama, you. You couldn't have. End of chapter 77. Trivia. In the game this arc is ripped of. I mean, inspired by, Shinga is actually a former hidden leaf anbu, as are Hakui and Dashan. I just changed Shinga from leaf to stone, because this particular adaptation doesn't really rely on him being former leaf. It also gives other villages some exposure. Chapter 78, Hidden Moon Part 6, Connection Hidden Moon Village Hospital, Shino stands guard over Kashiwama's hospital bed. He doesn't need to, of course, the dangers have passed, but he can't shake the guilt that he allowed his student to be injured to this extent in the first place. He's stood motionless since Shinga's plan was thwarted yesterday and hasn't left the boy's side. On the neighboring beds, Genzai, Jiriki, and Hifumi are also recovering from their heavy wounds, but they're at least conscious. Bored and antsy but conscious. Jiriki grumbles under his breath and shifts to the side of the bed to get off, but Shino stops him without even turning around. You shouldn't move. Your injuries may be relatively minor, all things considered, but you still need to stay put. Well I can't just lie here forever. Jiriki protests. Everything went crazy out there and Kashiwama is. He lowers his gaze. Kashiwama ended up like this. You won't be here forever. Just long enough for you all to heal and for Kashiwama to wake up. Shino explains. About that. Genzai chimes in. He was acting kind of weird when he ran off on his own. He kept saying. That he could hear it? that he needed to protect it. Was he? Talking about the Gashinboku? Hifumi asks. He went right for it, could they somehow communicate? That, I don't know. Shino says. There are many questions we need answered, but that will come with time. He didn't even bother to explain, he just. Went all on his own. Jiriki grumbles. Shino lets out a faint smile. That must be the Uzumaki part of him. Before Jiriki or Genzai can question what he means, the door opens for Tambo Sujibashi and Yuzora to enter the room. Yuzora herself only has light injuries as she took on a more support role to get everyone organized during the attack. Tambo, on the other hand, has his arm in a full cast held up in a sling, along with other more minor patched up wounds. How is he? Tambo asks, motioning to Kashiwama. Shino shakes his head. Hasn't shown signs of waking up yet. I'm sorry. Tambo bows so far that Shino can see his neck. It was my responsibility to look after your team during your stay, and I let this happen by not being with them. Nonsense, Shino answers bluntly. Your task was to look after them during missions. What happens in their free time is not your responsibility to carry. That's right, Genzai says. It was supposed to be a normal day of training, after all. It's not your fault, Tambo-sensei. Hifumi looks down at her legs. It was my idea to go so far out of the village. Maybe if we went training somewhere closer. Jiriki groans and falls back in his bed. Is everyone just going to blame themselves? Is that what we're doing? As I said, you've no reason to apologize. Shino nods to the man. Still, I can't help but feel guilty. Ambo says. Yuzara steps forward, having waited for Tambo to say his word. May we have a word in private, Shino? Shino looks to her for a moment and then back to Kashiwama. I'll stay with them. Tambo chimes in. It's the least I could do. After another moment of silence and deliberation, Shino finally nods. Very well. He straightens his jacket as he stands up and turns to his genin. You stay in bed. Yes, sensei. Genzai and Jiriki answer back. Shino walks to the door, exchanges a quick nod with Tambo, and follows Yuzara outside. Moon Touch Tower 
At the very top of the tower remains a very sad and somber sight. The once powerful and mighty Gashinboku is now reduced to a sickly and thin shadow of its former self. Many of its weaker branches were removed so they don't break off on their own and injure someone, while the remaining form of the tree is held together with a wooden skeleton. The village is still in too much of a shock to fully discuss what future there is for their sacred tree or what future there is for their village without it. Some remnants of the Jubako remain as well, but much of it has been cleared already. The only people up here currently are Tsukino and Higure Kuchinashi, with the cleaning crew having been sent away for a rather private meeting. The two greet Yuzara and Shino as they arrive at the garden. Yuzara bows and goes to stand by her leader's side. You wish to speak. Shino states. Tsukino nods. Yes, although another word of gratitude might be an order and an apology that you were caught up in all of this. There's no need for that. Have you been able to find out more about this Jubako that Shinga summoned? If we can find out where he discovered such an existence, we may be able to learn more. Higure lowers his gaze in embarrassment. That's what we wanted to talk to you about. Tsukino steps forward. Since we already trusted you, we see little reason to not trust you with this as well. Shino raises a brow. The Jubako was at the base of the moon-touched tower and has been there for a hundred years. Our village originally started as a small settlement dedicated to guarding the Gashinboku and aided in keeping the Jubako at bay, but we don't actually know where they came from. Just that they hold immense power. Or, held. Shino takes a deep breath and looks over the three of them, noting their apologetic gazes. Why was this information not disclosed earlier? Were you hoping to gain the aid of the Shinobi Union with only half-truths? That's not it at all. Yuzara chimes. We just forgot about it until yesterday. Shino raises a brow. Forgot? Tsukino nods. When Shinga died, our memories came back to us. Memories that he erased with his jutsu. He made all of us forget about the Jubako's seed and the true purpose of the Gashinboku, so he could further his plans in peace. I know his jutsu involves mind control, but I wasn't aware he could erase memories as well. It's likely he grew since leaving his village. Yuzara says. Tsukino chuckles lightly. You know, it's actually funny in a twisted way. If we still remembered the seed, I don't know if I would have agreed to negotiate with the Shinobi Union. Because he erased our memories, he inadvertently opened the path for you to be here to stop him. You say you'd be apprehensive yet the Hidden Moon is known for being the most open and welcoming. If you had such a secret, wouldn't you wish to keep people away? Shino states what he feels is obvious. It's something that started a long time ago. Tsukino explains. Our grandfathers opened the doors to make our village seem non-threatening. If we were hiding some powerful weapon, then surely we wouldn't allow strangers in. I suppose it was bound to backfire eventually. The art of misdirection. I can't help but admire the attempt. So what happens with the Jubako and Gashinboku now? Well, Higure sighs, the Jubako is fully dead, and the Gashinboku is. He looks over the ruined form of their tree, not looking that much better, either. I feel this may be the end of our sacred duty. Shino looks over the tree from top to bottom, noting the very lowest part of the tree has retained some of its whiter coloration. Not all has turned to ash. Specifically, it's the spot where he found Kashiwama being embraced by its branches. It may yet survive. He motions to the white trunk at the base of the tree. It hasn't fully died. It even managed to bring itself back one final time to destroy the Jubako. Tsukino turns to him. That's actually another thing I wanted to talk to you about. The circumstances of the Gashinboku's revival, do you think Kashiwama sent you had a hand in it in any way? Shino shakes his head. That, I can't say. Shinga fully prevented me from seeing anything. Higure rubs his chin. He is from the famed Senju clan of the forest. They have a special connection, and if what Hifumi Sujibashi said is true, that he could hear something calling to him. But the Gashinboku has never been recorded speaking to anyone. Yuzara says. If it could do that, why would it call out to the boy in its time of need and not us, its guardians? Another mystery we may never solve. Tsukino sighs. That said, I presume you'll want to return home now that your mission is over. We'll wait for you and your team to heal, and in the meantime we'll answer any further question you most likely have for us. Shino cocks his head. Is my mission over? Tsukino shrugs. Well, the only reason for the Shinobi Union to want to ally with us was the Gashinboku and its medicinal properties. Without it, we've nothing to offer your alliance that could benefit it. I wouldn't say that's the case. The Shinobi Union exists to unite the formerly torn Shinobi world. Contrary to what you may think or have heard, it's not about other villages being useful to us. It's about us all working together. If you'll have us, we are the ones who wish to be of benefit for you. 
Those are certainly some fantastical words, Shino Aburama. Tsukino chuckles. It certainly would be nice if such a world could exist. Then help us build it. Shino extends his hand. Tsukino looks down at his hand and then back to Higure and Yuzara, who give reaffirming nods. Let's. She takes his hand and the two shakes. Then we should finalize these negotiations with our full memories. Shino says with a straight face. I'll send word to the Hidden Leaf to send support and get the Hidden Moon up and running again. Thank you. Two days later. Hidden Leaf Village. Hakage's Tower. Sonata flips through a folder with great speed and annoyance, with many of the pages get bent and twisted as she moves on to the next, after only a brief scan. Ibiki Marino, Shizune Yumino, and Kakashi Hataka stand at attention, not making a peep, as she does very little to hide her annoyance. Is this it? She looks up at Ibiki Marino. These are all the men you have available? Well, yes, I sent most of them to the Hidden Dream Village. We had to scan every shinobi there to weed out the traitors and conspirators, which takes a lot of time and effort. Ibiki explains. I didn't think another village would be attacked in the same week. Sonata throws the folder onto her desk and rubs her temple. We have two dead and one in captivity. If anyone would know about allies, it's them. Ino Yamanaka's return from the hidden dream, correct? Get her to scan the minds of the two deceased and you, she points at Ibiki, get the other one to talk. I'll assemble a team and leave right away. Sonata raises her hand and on command, an Anbu flickers down by Ibiki's side. Sai, assemble a team of your own to help with the Hidden Moon's defense. Shizune, you too, get a team of medics ready. Me? Shizune stumbles over her words. But you need me here to coordinate. No, I need you over there yesterday to organize the relief efforts. This is a disaster that now affects the Shinobi Union and the ninja world at large. I can't afford to send anyone second best, do you understand? With Sakura still in the hidden dream, you have to go to the hidden moon. Kakashi will stay behind. Shizuna nods with a bit of apprehension, but it's not like she can defy direct orders, especially in such a time of crisis. Yes ma'am. I'm aware we're spreading ourselves thin. Sonata explains. But now's not the time to hold back. I need my best to deal with all of this in a timely manner, and that's you lot. So get to it. Yes ma'am. They all say in unison. Sai disappears as suddenly and quietly as he appeared, while Ibiki and Shizuna head for the door to make their own arrangements. With only Tsunade and Kakashi left in the office, the Hakage leans back in her chair and sighs. Why did it have to be us? She rests her elbow on her armrest and rubs her temple in a desperate attempt to rid herself of the headaches. Unfortunately for her, the headaches are emotional. Hopefully we won't also be attacked while our best and brightest are away. Kakashi says with a completely straight face. Sonata looks up at him narrowed eyes peeking through her fingers. Now why would you go and say something like that? Kakashi gives an innocent smile under his mask. Well, Naruto is already back so we should be fine. Sonata shakes her head. It's then that someone knocks on the door. Lady Hakage, I've returned from my mission. A muffled voice comes through just before the man opens the door. Yamato steps through. I'm here to deliver my report on. Yamato? Sonata interrupts. Excellent. You're to join Sai's team to the Hidden Moon Village and help them rebuild. Yamato stands by the half-open door and blinks. Why? They suffered a plot to destroy them, as well, and have suffered many casualties in the process. Yamato hangs his head. Another one. Sorry. I know this isn't the kind of grunt work the head of Anbu should be doing, but with your unique talents, you're the only one who can do it. So, what happened this time? He asks. Find Sai, he'll brief you while you prepare. At least I haven't unpacked yet. Yamato laments as he turns around to walk back out. Hang in there, Tenzo. Kakashi gives him a reassuring thumbs up. Yamato gives a half-hearted wave before closing the door. Hidden Moon Village With aid from the Hidden Leaf Village dispatched with utmost haste, the people in Shinobi of the Hidden Moon are able to breathe a sigh of relief and feel the benefit of allying themselves with the rest of the nations. Shizune immediately takes over the hospital and gets things in order, placing some of the more severe cases in the few capsule units they were able to pack. The result of Tsunada personally working on upgrading the Hidden Rain's technology to better serve their function of serving as a small portable healing station. Sai makes himself and his team available to the Hidden Moon Shinobi, and they set up a patrol on the off chance that someone or something decides to take advantage of the weakened Hidden Moon Village, or if Shinga had any other associates that remained hidden. Ino and Ibiki each get with their own forms of intelligence gathering, with Ino and a few of her subordinates from the analysis team going through Shinga and Hakui's memories. 
Shinga's mind proves far too fractured to get an accurate reading, most likely either a side effect or a defense mechanism of his Jibaku mind controlling Jutsu. She figures she may be able to get a read on it, but it would take time. Hakui's mind offers a few more answers, such as when Shinga concocted this plan, how they infiltrated the hidden moon village, and how they manipulated everything, but there doesn't seem to be anyone else to worry about at the present. As far as Hakui knows, only the three of them knew about this plot. Ibiki gets pretty much the same out of Dashin. The boy doesn't know much of anything, just that they were going to destroy the village and threaten the shinobi world which he saw no problem with. Yamato, while the main reason for his inclusion was to help rebuild, is also tasked with checking in on the Gashinboku's state. He examines it with an appraising eye and tries to revitalize it with his wood style, but the tree doesn't respond to his chakra. It's like it completely rejects his influence, or he's possibly not strong enough to influence it in any meaningful way. If this truly is some sort of offshoot of the divine tree, then it would make sense. When even Yamato's efforts prove fruitless, the Hidden Moon leaders make the difficult decision to fully cut down the Gashinboku's trunk and finally lay it to rest. It's a painful process to them, an end of an era and a duty they'd welcomed with open arms, and now they no longer have that. They do end up leaving the very bottom of the tree intact, as it still seems to be holding onto some life despite the trunk and most of its roots having rotted away. Much to their surprise, when they fully and entirely clear the dead parts of the Gashinboku, they find a very small stem sprouting from the base of the trunk. A small bulb on the top gives them hope that maybe the Gashinboku will restore itself to normal, although that would take many many years. Hidden Moon Village Hospital When the relief teams arrive from the Hidden Leaf, one of the first things done is to check up on Kashiwama Senju. Shizuna herself tends to Tsunada's cousin after getting everything else in order, and she does manage to speed up the healing process, enough to where he wakes up soon after. When Kashiwama opens his eyes, he spends the first few seconds in a state of confusion. His blurry half-open eyes dart around the white ceiling and white walls, and the room filled with beds. He rolls over on his side in an attempt to get up, but is stopped by a hand holding him on the shoulder. You shouldn't move. Gen's eyes voice comes through. At least his ears are still working, if not his eyes. Genzai? Kashiwama mutters in a weak, dry voice. What? Happened? Where are we? We're safe. We're in the hospital right now. You took some heavy hits. Genzai helps him lay back down and grabs a glass of water from the stand next to the bed, helping his friend get some much-needed liquids in his system. Kashiwama coughs and clears his throat. You had pretty damn worried, you know. Jiriki says from the opposite side of the bed as he walks around to join Genzai's side. Running off like that. Genzai taps him on the shoulder. We can give the lecture when he recovers. What about? The tree. Kashiwama shoots up, but both his teammates hold him back. I said we're safe. Genzai reminds him. It's over now, Shino-sensei took care of it. The trees. A different story, but it's all good. You can rest up. We even got Hidden Leaf Shinobi here to help. I see. Kashiwama calms down and lies back down. I see. He closes his eyes. Genzai reaches over to a panel just above Kashiwama's bed and presses a button. Soon after, a team of Leaf and Moon medics enter the room to check up on the awakened boy. They check his vitals, the equipment he's currently connected to, and change his bandages after tending to his wounds again. Not long after, Shino also comes to the hospital room after being informed that Kashiwama's woken up. He sits down on a chair next to the bed, while the mostly healed Genzai and Jiriki sit on the neighboring empty bed. Tambo and Hifumi Tsujibashi come out of concern, as does the village head Tsukino, oddly enough. Tsukino stands further back than everyone else as to not overwhelm the poor boy and let him be surrounded by the people he's closest to. How are you feeling? Shino asks. Like a tree fell on me. Kashiwama tries to joke through the pain. I realize you're still recovering, but I have to ask. Do you remember anything of what happened? Kashiwama thinks hard for a moment and shakes his head. Not really. I just remember. Fighting that big tree thing and my headache getting worse and then. I woke up here. You don't remember the Gashinboku. Doing anything? Don't remember it protecting you? No, I don't. I remember it being in pain, though. It was hurting so much. Tsukino steps forward, only now joining the group gathered around Kashiwama's bed. So, you really were hearing the Gashinboku? He scratches his head. I wasn't really hearing it, but feeling? He searches for the right words. If that makes sense. Like, you know when your friend is stressed about something and you just kinda know they are without being told? Like how Jiriki always has this constipated look. 
Don't you drag me into your nonsensical answers. Juriki protest. So what did you feel? Pain, Kashiwama answers somberly. A lot of pain and fear. But also. A fighting spirit. It didn't want to give up and let you all down. It wanted to fight. And somehow you were the answer. Tsukino says more to herself as she goes deep into thought. Well, whatever happened and why ever the Gashinboku spoke to you, I'm thankful you were able to help. You can consider yourself an eternal friend to the Hidden Moon Village. Kashiwama grins. He, really? Don't let it get to your head. Shino says. Too late for that. Genzai laughs. As interested as I am in talking about your experience, I think it's best you rest for now. Tsukino smiles. All right, everyone, let's get out. Genzai taps Kashiwama on the shoulder as he gets up to leave. Glad to have you back. You know I can't leave you two alone, you'd never get anything done without me. Genzai chuckles. Outside of the room, everyone parts ways to go where they're needed. Tsukino still has to manage the rebuild, Tambo and Hifumi go to help their fellow shinobi in whatever ways they can, with Yuriki and Genzai also doing some minor grunt work, now that they've recovered a bit. Shino lags behind a bit when he sees one man in particular making his way to him just as he exits the hospital. Yamato waves to him. Hello Shino. Captain Yamato. Shino nods. I was actually hoping to run into you when you're not busy. Oh? What can I do for you? I'd like to ask you to check up on Kashiwama, check how his chakra has been developing. Yamato scratches his chin. I suppose I could but there's people much better at that than I am. For this specific thing, it has to be you. Shino states. Yamato's expression turns serious. Is this about what happened with the Gashinboku? How it seemed to react to him? Yes. I have my suspicions, but with Kashiwama going unconscious, he can't confirm them. I believe this is also a conversation Lady Tsunade and Fusuma should be a part of. Yamato nods in understanding. I think I get it and if you're right, this may change. Well, everything. I agree, that's why we must first verify. Right. I'll do what I can, then. Yamato? Over the next two days, Kashiwama recovers under Shizuna's care and is up and running in record time. Somehow he even looks better than Genzai and Juriki who weren't even unconscious and were recovering at a normal pace. Beyond that, nothing much actually happens. Shino and Tsukino finalize the negotiations, and the Hidden Moon Village agrees to join the Shinobi Union, after meeting with other representatives from the Hidden Leaf, to make everything official. The only thing left after that is for Team 5 to go home. The four of them gather at an assigned spot around the center of the village, not far from the ruined moon-touched tower, with the people they've made friends with there to send them off. Yamato and a small group of shinobi who have completed their tasks are also present to get back home. Hifumi has a heartfelt farewell with Kashiwama and Genzai, with Juriki standing just behind. I hope we can see each other again. Hifumi says. Of course we will. Kashiwama gives a thumbs up. We're allies now, right? So we'll definitely get to work together soon. I don't know if your village will take part since you follow a different system, but the Chunin exams aren't that far off. If we can convince Shino-sensei to let us participate, we might run into each other there. I hope so. Hifumi grins. Kashiwama raises his hand, palm facing her. Then, until then. Hifumi high-fives him. Yeah. Genzai smiles and offers a high-five of his own, then they all turn expectantly to Juriki. He stares them down for a few seconds, but ends up losing the showdown. He sighs and raises his hand, as well, although not as high as his teammates. Yeah, I guess. It wasn't as bad as I thought it'd be. All things considered. Hifumi high-fives him with greater intensity than he would have liked. Kashiwama laughs and drapes an arm over his shoulder. That's him saying he likes you. I've said no such thing. To the side, Tsukino and Shino exchange a handshake. Once again, thank you for everything. Tsukino expresses her gratitude. And thank you for the opportunity. I realize it was one made possible as a side effect of Shinga's jutsu but, but. Given how else it could have ended, Tsukino smiles. I'd say it turned out well. You have some incredible students on your team. Tambo steps by Tsukino's side. I dare say they could have done well even without my guidance. Shino smiles. They're indeed very gifted. They may very well soon outgrow me, as well. Oh, I'm sure that's not going to happen. Tambo laughs. After Yazara and Higir say their farewells, as well, other shinobi and people from the Hidden Moon say their goodbye and thanks to Shino whose contributions they were informed about. It's an odd sensation for Shino to put in the spotlight in such a way. A part of him can't help but enjoy the recognition, but another part of him also prefers to remain in the background. Thankfully for him, 
he doesn't have to endure for much longer as a pitch black portal opens up behind them. Tsukino is slightly startled by its sudden appearance. So, that's what you were talking about, everyone, Shino calls out to his students. We're going home. See you soon, Hifumi. Kashiwama waves as he jumps through, followed by Genzai and Jiriki. Shino, Yamato, a couple of Hidden Moon Shinobi jump in after just as the portal closes behind them. Hidden Leaf Village On the other side of the portal, they find themselves on top of the Hakage Tower and are greeted by the nostalgic sight of their home after being away for over a week and the somewhat tired face of one Sasuke Uchiha. Is this what I've been reduced to? He laments. Yamato pats him on the shoulder in sympathy. Hang in there. We'll get through it. He fights back an imaginary tear. Hinata steps forward to greet the Hidden Moon Shinobi that came with. I'm Hinata Uzumaki, representative of the Shinobi Union for the Hidden Leaf. She bows. One man steps forward and bows back. My name is Kaiki Tenmondai. I was assigned to the Hidden Leaf as representative. If you follow me, I can help you get accustomed to the village. She motions for him and the ones with him to come with her. Before she leaves, she turns to her former teammate. It's good to see you back in one piece, Shino. Welcome back, all of you. Shino smiles. It's good to be back. Jiriki bows to her. Thank you. She leads the new members of the union away to meet with the rest of the ever-growing representatives. Shino turns to his genin. Why don't you all go home and rest? I'll handle the mission report and have your pay sent to your homes. Yes, sensei. Except for you, Kashiwama. Shino interrupts him just as he's about to depart. Huh? Sure. Kashiwama looks to him in confusion as to why he can't go home. See you guys later, okay? He says to Genzai and Jiriki. Yeah, see ya. Genzai waves to him. Just try not to make your injuries worse. Jiriki says as they head off. Shino and Yamato exchange a look and a confirming nod and go to the Hakage's office along with Kashiwama. It's an extremely short walk, but to the young Senju it feels much longer. Shino-sensei isn't explaining why he's walking with them to the Hakage's office and he's getting a little worried. With a knock on the Hakage's office's door, they're allowed in and are met by the fifth Hakage, Sonata Senju, sitting behind her desk as usual and by her side are, oddly enough, the head of the Senju clan, Fusuma Senju, and her husband Shoji. Mom? Dad? What are you doing here? Kashiwama walks over to them. That's what I'm wondering, as well. Fusuma pats him on the head. You called for us, Shino? I did, yes. Concerning something I omitted from my initial report as I wish to discuss it in complete privacy. Sonata raises a brow. And what precisely is this about? It's about Kashiwama's powers. Later. Shino walks through the streets of the Hidden Leaf, having finished reporting every single detail to the Hakage and the Senju. He takes a moment to enjoy the fresh air of home that's like no other, carried gently by a breeze that causes his green cloak to billow. Initially, his mind is preoccupied with thoughts of home, to sit by Shiho's side and hold Shichi in his arms. He missed his wife and son more than he realized, especially once things began looking dire in the fight against Shinga. His attention is drawn elsewhere, however, as his eyes lead him up to the very top of a post where a very familiar orange cloak billows in the wind. He sees Naruto apparently smoking from a pipe which is, odd, he doesn't remember Naruto ever smoking. He decides to flicker up by his classmate's side, focusing chakra to his souls to stick to the side of the pole just next to Naruto who doesn't even flinch at his arrival. I didn't think of you as the smoking type. Shino says in place of a greeting. Yeah, I don't think I am, either. Naruto coughs to clear his throat. You back from your mission in the Hidden Moon? I am, Shino nods, and already I'm hearing you've caused quite the commotion with your own mission. It didn't quite go according to plan. Then we share that in common. Yeah? Naruto raises a brow. Wanna share what happened? And I'll tell you what happened on mine. Shino chuckles. Swapping stories might be fun. Just, don't smoke. My Kikachu are sensitive to smoke. Can't smoke at home, can't smoke outside. Naruto sighs and puts away his pipe. Come on, first drinks are on me. He stands up and pats Shino on the shoulder. And the next. On me. Shino says. I believe we may have a long evening ahead of us. Later that evening. Yamanaka Flower Shop. The Hidden Leaf Police Force make regular patrols around the streets to ensure that there's no wrongdoings going on. For the most part, teams of two go around a set route and are in charge of their own sectors. The Leaf saw it as a way to help bring the people in the police closer together by creating a sense of community, 
have the patrolling officers feel more like part of the scenery and people who belong there, rather than strangers who only pass occasionally. This specific section is technically patrolled by three officers. Kibi Amanaka, his partner and close friend Akamaru, and his official partner Ami Aburama, a woman as one would expect of the Aburama clan. Thick coat that mostly hides her form, dark and glasses that make her expression more difficult to read, and is an ever quiet and stoic presence. Kiba can't help but wonder how he keeps getting assigned to Abu Rama, they're the exact opposite of him in terms of attitude. While on their patrol, Kiba makes an abrupt stop in front of one shop in particular. Ah, just give him a second, will ya, Ami? Ami nods. Be swift. We've our patrol to finish. Yeah, yeah. Kiba waves her off, and Akamaru sits down by her side. He opens the door to a dinging bell hung just above it, placed to sound off whenever someone enters. As it's nearing the end of the working day, the flower shop is empty save for the one woman behind the counter, whose expression turns from bored to happy when she sees Kiba enter. Excuse me, miss. We've received multiple complaints of a gorgeous woman breaking and stealing hearts around these parts. You wouldn't happen to know anything about that? Eno giggles and leans over the counter, batting her eyes. Why, officer, I would never. Kiba walks over and leans on the counter. Theft and destruction of private property are serious crimes, I'll have you know. If I find out you're hiding something from me. And what would the punishment be, precisely? Well, for such heavy crimes, she'd have to be put under constant and very close observation. A task I'm more than willing to take on to keep our streets safe. Eno laughs and pulls him in for a kiss. Are you that bored at work? It's been a day. Kibba laughs with her. Shift's almost over, though, so there's that. How's the shop? Eno peeks over Kibba's shoulder, hi Ami, and waves at the woman outside who nods as an acknowledgement. Been normal. It's good to have days where I can tend to the shop myself. I need the change of scenery. I feel ya. Say, how about we ask sis to babysit for a bit longer, and we can go out to town. Kibba smirks. Eno shakes her head. We can't just spring it on her last minute, Kibba. If you want to take me out and woo me, you'll have to plan it better and in advance. And here I thought you liked the spontaneity. I do, but we also have to actually take care of our daughter, big guy. She comes before everything. Yeah, I know. He sighs. Kibba, Ami, a statusy voice from Kibba's waist interrupts their moment. Come in. Kibba presses a button on his radio and speaks into the microphone strapped to his headband. We're here, what's up? We've received a complaint from Shushuya in your sector. Two unruly drunks are disturbing the peace. Kibba sighs. Guess this evening won't be ending peacefully, huh? Eno chuckles and pats him on the back. You got this. Ami opens the door and peeks her head in. Let's go. Yeah, I'm going. Shushuya. When Kibba and Ami and Akamaru arrive on the scene, they're immediately met by a group of onlookers, some of whom are visibly displeased with one man in particular. From this distance, they can only assume it's clients complaining to a manager or someone similarly in charge. When the man sees them approach and notices their police force armbands, he immediately breaks free from the crowd and runs to them. Oh, I'm so happy to see you. You have to do something about them, they're infesting my whole establishment. All right, chill. Kibba waves him off and just continues walking to the front door. It's just a couple of drunks, what's the big deal? Ami turns to the manager. What do you mean when you say infesting? Before she can be given an answer, she sees it. When Kibba opens the door, the entry is crawling with, oddly enough, Kakechu. That's what I mean. The manager points. Whoa. Kibba steps back. What the hell is all this? Ami walks over by him. They're erratic. It's as if they have no guiding force behind their actions. This is just what I needed, geez. Kiba complains. Think you can do something about him? I can attempt to. Ami sends out her own Kakechu to try and guide the aimless Kakechu that have overtaken Shushuya. By sending out only a few that excrete a certain pheromone, she's able to at the very least clear a path for them to move through and not injure any of them. While everyone else is outside, there's still the very distinct sound of jovial laughter coming from one of the stalls at the very back. As they walk past the empty tables, many of them with scattered plates and bottles left behind or knocked over in the rush to get out, they reach the very last set of tables. One of the men laughs. So you barely keeping him in check, huh? The other man laughs back in a more subdued manner. Just barely. It must be something from the Uzumaki side of his lineage. Hey, don't you pin this on me. There, they see a very boisterous blonde man wearing a thick green coat and opposite of him. A more laid-back but still jovial man in an orange cloak. Lord Shino, 
Ami says in surprise, one of the very few times Kiba has actually seen her flustered. And Naruto? Kiba raises a brow. What the fuck, guys? Oh, Kiba. Naruto turns to them. Whatcha doing here? Sit down and join us. Yeah. Shino readily agrees. We're drinking. Yeah, I can see that. Ami bends over by Shino's side. Lord Shino, you have to recall your kakechu. You're causing a disturbance. Eh, why should I? They need some fresh air, too. You should know that, Emi, I'm very disappointed in you. My name's Ami, sir. That's what I said, wasn't it? Okay, get up, you too. Kiba grabs Naruto by the arm and pulls him away from the table. And why did you swap clothes? Oh, well, boo. Naruto protests as he wobbly hops as he's being dragged. When did you get to be such a stick in the ass? He's right. Shino nods. You need to learn to relax, Kiba. Kiba looks between the two of them in disbelief. I can't even believe this is happening right now. Okay, Shino, you need to get home, right? You just got back from a mission. Does Shiho know you're here? No. He presses his index to his lips. And don't tell her. Oh, I think she'll figure it out somehow. Come, sir, I'll help you. Ami offers to help him. He immediately brushes her off. I don't need help. I'm in complete control of my body. He barely manages to take two steps before his legs give out under him, and he falls on his butt. He looks up to Ami. I seem to not be in complete control of my body. Kiba looks around at the hundreds of kakechu in the place. What are we even supposed to do about these? I have it covered. Ami goes to speak into her radio. This Ami Abu Rama. I request backup from an Abu Rama at Shushuya. There are kakechu running wild, I need aid in getting them out. Copy that. Comes a voice from the radio. Sending someone right away. I'll wait here for backup to arrive, you take Naruto home. Ami says. You sure you don't want me to wait? Kiba asks. Ami shakes her head. I believe it better to separate them. Kiba chuckles. Yeah, you're probably right. All right, Naruto, let's get you home. Kiba wraps his arm around Naruto's back to support him and leads him out. Ami stays behind and commands her kakechu to run damage control and try to round up Shino's much more numerous kakechu. She'll do what she can for now. Shino, still sitting on the ground, leans his back against the bench. You're doing a good job. I'm proud of you. Even though you were just disappointed. Ami sighs. Did you enjoy your evening, sir? Shino thinks for a moment and smiles. Yes, I believe I did. End of chapter 78